Calling to order the Federated City Employees Retirement System Board meeting for August 19th, 2021. I can take And um, I'm going to remind all speakers to clearly state their name for the recording when they speak and to otherwise leave their audio off for clarity. We'll take a roll call to see who is here. Um, by order of um, seniority, uh, Trustee Chandra. Present. Trustee Orr. Present. Trustee Kelleher. Present. And Trustee Jennings. Present. Okay. Just a reminder of the ground rules. All votes will be roll call votes. Uh, if you're not speaking, please be on mute to cut background noise. For discussion items, each trustee will have a turn to speak in roll call order, more than once if desired. And the public will also have an opportunity to speak on each item after trustees. The public will also have an opportunity to speak again at the end of the meeting on any other item on the agenda that is within the subject jurisdiction of the board. We have a pretty full calendar today. We have a time certain item at 11 a.m. That's item 4D, which is the city staff discussion of pension obligation bonds. We have three presentations on pension obligation bonds. Um, and they are items 3A, 4C, and 3B. And I would like to take them all together as, as it makes uh, more logical sense. So I would like to uh, change the order in which we hear the items after item 3A to include items 4C, 3B, and 4D in that order. Uh, I also plan to take a break somewhere in the 10 o'clock hour. We'll see how that proceeds. And there will be a recess from one o'clock to 105 to accommodate the Civic Center broadcasting system. Uh, do we need to waive sunshine and any attachments? No. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to accept the orders of the day? Trustee Keller, so motion. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, Trustee Chandra, second. So that's a motion by Trustee Keller, second by Trustee Chandra. Uh, trustee discussion, public discussion. We'll have a roll call vote. Uh, trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Uh, trustee Jennings? Aye. Okay, it passes, so we will proceed with the agenda as amended. So the first item today is a ceremonial item. Um, and if we can call up the attachment on the screen. A commendation to Trustee Jay Castellano for his long service as trustee to the board. Can we, can we move the attachment to where it's visible on the screen?
Here we go. Well, I won't read the entire uh, commendation. Obviously, uh, Trustee Castellano has been an, a very important member of the board. Uh, I don't believe anyone is as sorry to see him go as I am right now. And um, we would like to extend our thanks, our gratitude, and our recognition for his long service. And at this point, I will allow any other trustees to speak if they wish. Trustee Kelleher, I'd also like to say thank you for your uh, tremendous leadership over the last year and a half that I've been on the board. Thank you, Trustee Kelleher. Thank you. This is, this is Trustee Chandra, and I just wanted to echo the sentiments of my fellow trustees, Horowitz and Kelleher. Uh, Jay, it's, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, it, it, you know, meeting new people uh, through this experience has been uh, one of the highlights, and uh, you've been among those highlights, and I hope we keep in touch personally. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Trustee Jennings, um, I just want to say that I as well um, have enjoyed having Jay uh, as part of the team. Uh, Jay and I worked together back in Parks and Rec, and he has brought, I believe, a lot of organizational structure um, and um, governance to uh, the board, and um, this is I mean, he excels in this, and um, he's been great, and it was very sad to see him go. Um, so thank you, Jay, and I know we'll be in touch. Yes, thank you, Julie. And I'm sure uh, Trustee Castellano is going to remain as an active member of the public, uh, viewing our board meetings, looking over our shoulders. So we will, we will try to fly right. Um, do I hear a motion to uh, accept M this? Let Mr. Me Chair? Yes. If I can have a, a comment uh, on okay. behalf of okay. the staff. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, trustee Castellano, or uh, former trustee and chair Castellano, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the Office of Retirement Services staff, on behalf of, of the plan members and the stakeholders in general, um, we just want to wish you uh, success and uh, best of luck in your future endeavors. Um, you have been uh, certainly a very positive influence uh, in the plan and, and the board and staff in general. Um, you came in at a difficult time uh, where our prior chair led the board for some 10 years and we were in need on some new and steady leadership and you came in and and, um, and took us through uh, a difficult timing, especially the downturn on, on the economy, on the market related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, you know, again, I just want to echo the, way, the, the words by your peers, uh, not just a steady leadership, but uh, strong support of staff. Uh, we have always greatly appreciated that. And um, you will be greatly missed. So uh, thank you so much uh, for all your hard work, uh, dedication, engagement, and commitment over the last few years. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. I think as uh, new Chair Horowitz uh, uh, indicated, uh, we hope that you uh, stay connected and attend our board meetings. I don't want to speak for the new chair, but I think uh, as much as I can tell he enjoys uh, being the chair of the board, he's probably also getting a sense of uh, the challenges of becoming a chair and how much more engagement <laughs> you have to have with staff. <laughs> so again, uh, best of luck to you, and and certainly we hope that uh, you know as as time goes on, if you decide to eventually come back for a second round, uh, I'm sure <laughs> that we will be uh, we work uh, positively on that approach. So again, thank you so very much, and best of luck to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, CEO Pena. Would anyone else like to speak? Well, let's Mr. move forward. Chair, Sorry, Mr. Sorry. Chair, if I could uh, respond uh, oh, yeah. briefly. I know I know you have closed session and a long agenda, so I'll, I'll be brief. But I, I do want to thank 
thank the board for the commendation. I, I do, do truly appreciate the acknowledgement. Um, and it really was my honor to serve with you um, in doing this uh, extremely meaningful work uh, together. Um, I, I want to, um, uh, I want to thank <coughs> um, each of you board members, uh, as well as council member Davis, um, you know, on the, again, you know, with this opportunity to serve, and I certainly would do it again if the opportunity arises. Um, Mr. Pena, Mr. Lederman, I'd like to, um, you know, call you out for your counsel and the invaluable gift of confidence in working, um, uh, taking over chair last year. Um, I, I really, um, it, it, was, it, it was just invaluable to me, and I'm sure uh, Chair Horowitz that they'll offer that same support to you too. And lastly, I'd like to thank all the staff who worked tirelessly to support this, the board as well as the members. I'll call out uh, Linda, Marty, and Michelle for um, offering me help before I knew I needed it. <laughs> just consistently, uh, just amazing um, skill that you folks have. So again, thank you all for the accommodation, uh, for the uh, accommodation and the um, opportunity to serve with you. I, I do wish all of you well. And I, I do look forward to attending future board meetings. Thank you, Trustee Castellano. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Well, uh, Jay, I certainly hope you, you will stick around and offer us your advice and insight, either personally or to the board as we move forward. And um, I'd like to call uh, for a roll call vote on this commendation. Any discussion? Any public comment? Then we will ask uh, Trustee Chandra, how, do, how, how say you? I believe you're on mute. I was on mute twice on my phone and Zoom. Sorry about that. I uh, enthusiastic aye. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Oh, I'll also give an enthusiastic aye. And Trustee Jennings. Enthusiastic aye. And I also vote aye with enthusiasm, so the motion passes unanimously. Thank you again, Trustee Jay. Thank you all. Thank you all. Okay, I believe the next item on the agenda is a moving into closed session. And so Linda, will you be moving us over? Marty and Michelle will move you over. Okay. Harvey, I don't know if you were.
Okay, we're resuming our regular agenda, and um, I believe we approved the consent calendar. Is that correct? No, not yet, Mr. Chair. Not yet. I see. Okay. <clears throat> so, here we are. Uh, I thought we had approved, but in any case, we we have a few yeah. items on the uh, calendar, all related to the pension obligation bond. They are variously under items uh, 3B, 4C, and 4D. 4D is time certain at 11 a.m., but I think for the effectiveness of our conversation, uh, we should hear these items together. First, 4C, which is the Chiron update of our uh, actuarial performance. Uh, then 3B, which is a presentation by our CIO and Makeda and Virus. And then finally, 4D, which is the city staff uh, presentation on pension obligation bonds. So I'd like to change uh, the order uh, so that we hear uh, 4C, 3B, and 4D in that order. Um, do I hear a, a, a motion to do so? I give you a motion. Chairman, you've, you've already uh, passed a motion to approve that orders of the day as requested. Okay. Okay. You're on, so you're on. Consent calendar. Uh, so do we have a, do we need a motion then to approve the consent calendar? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. This is Trustee Chandra. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Thank you. This is Trustee Jennings. I'll second it. Thank you. Any discussion? Any public comment? Uh, uh, yes, Trustee Horowitz. Yes. Um, this is Barbara Heyman, Deputy Director of ORS. Um, we have on the agenda today um, Amanda Ramos. I, um, I'd like to recognize Amanda, uh, who's on the agenda. She's retiring from city service with over 16 years of service. Amanda spent much of her city career working for ORS. She worked as a benefit analyst for several years, uh, most recently prior to leaving city service as the senior health benefits analyst. Um, Amanda was you know, a very dedicated worker. She was always looking for opportunities for improving services and she worked tirelessly to serve our members and the boards. And we'd like to thank her for her service. Yes, thank you very much. Is she present? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, if I can just uh, comment to that. Thank you, Barbara. I just wanna echo uh, Barbara's words. Uh, I want to, again, on behalf of the uh, federated membership um, and, and the board, 
I just want to thank Barbara for, um, Amanda for her service. Uh, as, as Barbara indicated, uh, most of her career was spent at the uh, Office of Retirement Services. I had a chance to work closely with Amanda in her second time around when she was the senior benefit analyst for the healthcare. So uh, I want to again recognize her service and dedication over the years. And I just uh, want to uh, wish her the best of luck and a long and healthy retirement. So good luck, Amanda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, CEO Pena. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor to uh, approve the consent calendar. And I uh, believe there was no other comment, any public comments. We'll have a roll call vote then. Uh, Trustee Chandra. Aye. Trustee Orr. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. And Trustee Jennings. Aye. And I vote aye. So it is approved unanimously. And um, the the vote for on the consent calendar that uh, that includes all the elements under item one. Is that correct? Or do we need separate votes to approve the board minutes, for instance? No, that's correct. All items in number one. Okay. The next item is agenda item number two, death and survivorship notifications. And we will have a moment of silence to respect those who have given to their city service. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like uh, to say something, Trustee Jennings. Uh, go ahead. Uh, one of the people that are on that uh, notice uh, was our budget director for many, many years, who took us through some really bad times and worked with the city managers to keep us um, afloat during Larry Lisenby. Um, so he retired, he groomed uh, Jennifer McGuire to her position, and he also is the father of one of our ORS employees, David Lisenby, and uh, Larry was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, he was someone that kept the city afloat. He, uh, he built up the, the reserves that we had to get through the, the downtime during the dot com. Um, he was someone that you aspire to be. And um, my heart goes out to uh, his children, of which David is one. Um, not only did he just pass, but his wife passed a year before. Uh, and it saddens me to know that he is gone. Uh, he was young, you know, he was in his early 70s. Um, so he was someone that served the city really well. Thank you, Trustee Jennings. And I'm sure we all appreciate his service to the city. Uh, we are approaching uh, agenda item number three, investments. And as it is the 10 o'clock hour, May I suggest a five minute recess and we will resume uh, after at, on, on the, at I have 10.03, we can resume at 10.08. So we are momentarily uh, recessed.
Let's come back into session. Uh, are all the trustees back? I can't see. Um, can, can we take down the share screen for a moment? Yeah, I'm present. I, I'm off video for the moment. Okay, no, I see you there. It looks like uh, Trustee Kelleher. Trustee Jennings. Present. Yep, and here. Trustee Orr. Trustee Orr. I'm not seeing the video feed. Well, I'm sure she will be joining us shortly. So she let us. Away. I'm sorry, speak. Who is that? This is Marty. She stepped away. Okay. All right. Trustee uh, Horowitz, I'm, I'm back on as well. Right. I, okay. Thank you. Um, but I think we should proceed then with uh, agenda item 3A oral update from the CIO. Uh, CIO Polani, do you have any good news to share with us? Longer is the better of good news. Uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, good morning, Trustee. Hope you had a good July. Uh, it's August and we are back in business. Uh, unfortunately, another bad fire season. And certainly the skies over Fremont are smoky and gray. San Jose seems slightly better. Uh, the good news is your pension plan returned 29 and a half percent last year. And according to Makita, uh, we are in the top quartile of our peers, uh, which is also heartening. And I believe 77 of our peers have entered their returns. And that's the public pension plan, you know, is greater than $1 billion. So we've actually out, we outperformed by uh, CalPERS by about 700 basis points and uh, CalSTRS by about two and a half percent. So pretty gratifying returns there. Uh, of course, uh, those returns are because of the market and we were just fortunate uh, to be able to participate in the upside of the market thanks to uh, the smart moves made by the board last year. Um, but we are in a new fiscal year and so that's all past news. And so we have to look forward to this fiscal year and there's, there are considerable challenges ahead of us. Uh, inflation is one of them. Um, valuation is another. The Schiller PE, for those who follow it, is at 38, uh, which means assets, especially equity assets are very, very pricey. Uh, the all time high of the Schiller PE is 44, which was, uh, end 1999. And so, uh, and then of course, uh, you probably followed uh, Jay Powell and the Fed. The Fed is starting to taper its bond purchases. That's also going to put pressure on the market. So uh, there'll be a lot of challenges in the fiscal year ahead and we need to focus on that and be vigilant. And uh, I will uh, look, for, I look forward to working closely with the board as we navigate these challenges in the months ahead. And uh, look forward to discussions on asset allocation uh, later in the fiscal year. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm happy to take any questions. I have no further comments. Do any of the trustees have a question they would like to put to our CAIO? No, I told brother to give a warning to Any member of the public that would like to raise an issue? Well, hearing none, thank you, uh, CIO uh, Polani. Uh, we're going to move forward now. And according to, uh, to our slightly revised schedule, I think next we are going to hear item 4C, a presentation from Chiron on the updated pension projections and preliminary returns for the past fiscal year. And so if we can have a Good morning. representative from Chiron, there we are. Mr. Hall Hallmark, you have the floor. Yeah, let me uh, get my screen up here. Hopefully you can all see my screen now. Yes. It looks like the trends are going upward. 
the, those are the assets. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to uh, uh, update uh, our projections. We have uh, preliminary asset statements. And so uh, since we've had such an exceptional year, we wanted to uh, get the information out to the board and to the city uh, to understand how our projections have changed from the valuation. And um, these are not the final projections. We still are collecting the data for uh, the coming year uh, for the 2021 valuation. And we'll be going through that process and, and updating these further in the fall. But uh, those updates are likely to be uh, relatively minor uh, compared to what we've seen so far. So we wanted to get out uh, what we've seen so far. So hopefully this is loading. There we go. Uh, so last year in the valuation, uh, we started with a market value of assets of about 2.2 billion. We expected it to increase with contributions and about 145 million in expected earnings and decrease for benefit payments and expenses, ending the year at about 2.3 billion. But what happened is we got about 515 million more in investment earnings than expected. And so we've ended the year at about 2.8 billion in the market value of assets. We started the year uh, based on the market about 50% funded. So this red area is the unfunded liability and these are the assets. We had projected that to grow uh, so that we'd be about 52% funded by the end of the year. But uh, given the investment earnings, we're now projecting that to be 63%. That's a pretty significant change for us. Um, wow, that's pretty outstanding. I am impressed. Yeah, we still have a ways to go. We're only 63%, but... Uh, hmm. It's much better than it was. Oh, yeah. All right. That's tremendous. Then you look at what that implies going forward. Uh, we would now be projected to be 100% funded right around 2039 or 2040 if we continue to get six and five eighths percent returns. That's about uh, six years earlier than we had projected in the last valuation. Um, That's outstanding. Now, our contributions, the city's contributions in particular, are based on the actuarial value of assets instead of the market value. And the actuarial value, we smooth in gains and losses above what we expect over a five-year period in order to stabilize those contribution rates. We haven't talked about it much because our gains and losses have been relatively small the last few years, uh, but now we have a pretty substantial gain uh, of over 515 million. So the way this works is we recognize 20% uh, of that gain or loss each year. So the 2017 gain will be fully recognized in the 2021 valuation, and then 80, 60, 40, and only 20% of the most recent gain will be recognized. So what that means is, while we have 2.8 billion in the market value of assets, we're gonna calculate contributions based on 2.5 billion in assets. 
uh, because there's 400 million in gains we're not recognizing and about 67 million in losses that we haven't recognized yet. If you look at the funded status, you can see on the market, we got that substantial increase. On the actuarial value, it, it's better than we expected, but it's not such, such a substantial jump. Uh, we're 55% funded on the actuarial value. Um, but again, that's really just used to determine contributions. Um, we actually have 2.8 billion in assets. So what does that mean in terms of contributions? Uh, we expected the city's contribution to go from uh, 206 million up to about 213 million for the next fiscal year. Uh, instead, we're now expecting that to drop to about 205 million. Uh, so, and you can see the big part of the change is on the tier one assets where we'd expected it to go to 193 million and instead it'll be about 186 million. Tier two, there's uh, a slight drop compared to the expectations, but uh, not a significant change. It's still much smaller. If you look at our projections, the blue line is what we projected in the last valuation. And um, can this... I ask a question? Just sure. Simply, is that possible? Thanks. So that means if we're looking at employer contributions for the next fiscal year, we're looking at a savings to the city of about what six point eight million. Is that correct? Uh, compared to what we projected before. All right. It, it's about eight million less. Eight right? million less. Two thirteen versus two hundred five. Oh right, okay. So that's eight million less. That is a significant savings to the city for next year. It's a start. It's a pretty <laughs> good start, Council Member Davis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, it's really a $1 million savings. It's just that we don't have to find $6 million. <laughs> right. It's $1 million less, but it's uh, than they paid this year, but it's $8 million less than what we were uh, saying, what we told them they'd have to pay. So, um, so the operating budget is not based on... Um... Well, they do it one year at a time. Um, Capital does a five-year. Yeah, they have a five-year projection. But, they still um, have a five-year general fund projection, I mean, that they look at. So um, that is still good news as we're looking at operating and impacts. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So the, um, but because we're recognizing those gains over a five-year period, the full impact of the returns this year takes five years uh, to be realized. So the blue line here is what we had projected in the last valuation. If we continued to get six and five eights for the city contributions and um, the, the bars represent our new projection reflecting the new uh, investment earnings. And so, yeah, you see there's the, um, the relatively small change for 2023, but if you go out to 2027, when it's been fully recognized, you're looking at about a $47 million difference in, in the projections. Um, the dollar amount continues, to, uh, starts to increase after that because we are projecting uh, growth in payments uh, of 2.75%, but it maintains a pretty significant um, reduction from our prior projections uh, all the way out. Um, but this requires us to get the six and five eighths and for all the other assumptions to have been met. The, I think 
part of the big change is one of the concerns the city had was this continued increase in the contribution amount over time. Uh, and we've substantial, the new projections are substantially level uh, for quite some time. At 206 million, we don't get back to that amount under these projections until 2031. So um, if all of our assumptions hold, um, we're sitting at a fairly constant uh, contribution rate. Before you um, go off this slide, may I ask a question? Yes, please. So what would happen if the city kept their um, kept their contributions the same at 206 million every year, even though they're not, they wouldn't need to pay that amount? Uh, we would get funded more quickly. And so in these projections, it would mainly uh, reduce the amounts out here. Um, but I don't, I don't have that interactive set up. Uh, we could certainly look at that at the next meeting if that's an option the city wants to look at. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can maybe discuss this offline. Thanks. And <clears throat> Mr. Chair, if I may, um, Bill, thank you so much. I know you mentioned it. I, I just, I just can't help it but to emphasize what your statement about assuming all the assumptions are met. <laughs> yes. That's a big, big, big assumption, which we know, in fact, as an actuary, you know, the assumptions are almost never met. <laughs> Either they are exceeded or they're below. But obviously, I just, I, I just can't emphasize that enough, right? Uh, then, of course, We'll have more discussions later in the event the city does issue eventually a pension obligation bond. Those are further funds that could be potentially available, which certainly impact uh, all this work of projections going forward. So, uh, but again, I know you mentioned it, uh, uh, but I just get the impression sometimes that when you mention it, uh, maybe uh, the listeners, it, they just kind of hear that in passing and they don't emphasize the, the point that, that meeting the assumptions every year is, is just uh, very unlikely. And so these numbers uh, are going to change, hopefully for the better. But we do know that there may be a downturn in the economy at some point in the market, which you know will have to be reflected here as well. And these numbers don't reflect that. They assume that we'll make the assumed rate return uh, day, year in, year out for the next you know 20 years or so. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, exactly. Um... When we come back with the valuation and update these projections, uh, we will show that variability uh, and you can see it. The one advantage we have going forward now is we've only recognized 20% of the gain. So for the next um, four years, we have some built-in gains that are driving these uh, reductions in contributions. And so if we have a bad year, you're more likely to just see it level out uh, rather than, you know, when we didn't have those gains in the bank, uh, you'd see a much more quick uh, increase in contributions. Uh, fair point. Uh, I do. Uh, you, you are correct. And, and I don't know, Ms. Davis, so this, when I go to the city council every year, I make a point. One of my presentation slides is the is smoothing process. And it's exactly about that. I'm explaining the process of accounting for record, recording, uh, uh, recognizing 20 years of the gain and losses. And in fact, the last year when I went and the last couple of years, I have reminded the city council that what we had, as you stated in a, in a prior uh, slide, we still had different losses to recognize. So even, even if we met the assumed real return on a market basis, on an actual basis, we'll be earning less because we still have different losses uh, to be recognized, but now with this huge deferred gain, maybe that story will change a little bit going forward. So that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, it gives us a little bit of a cushion uh, going forward against rising contributions. And this would be the right time then for to continue making a level a level contribution that would further pay down that UAL. 
Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, whether it's the right time or not, I don't know. But, um, in terms of uh, the budget, assuming our assumptions are met, uh, you know, continuing that level of contributions is helpful in um, positioning the system uh, in a better spot. Thank you. Uh, this chart is just the same thing, but expressing the contribution as a percent of the projected payroll. Uh, we expect the payroll to, for federated in aggregate to increase about 3% a year. And so when you have those, those contributions level or, or going down as a percent of payroll, it, it goes down further. So, um, and, and Hopefully the general fund and, and revenue sources are increasing at the same rate as payroll. Um, and, and so that, if that were the case, then that would be showing a smaller and smaller percentage of the, the city's revenue going to pay these contributions. And I know that that's been a, an issue because the percentage of the general fund going to fund these retirement programs has been quite substantial. So that's really all I wanted to convey. Uh, I do want to, want to emphasize this last uh, point that Roberto uh, emphasized is uh, these are not the final uh, projections from the 2021 valuation, and they do uh, assume that all assumptions are met going forward. We have not reviewed the discount rate going forward. Um, that's something that comes up in the fall here, and the board could make a decision to change the discount rate. Um, so these projections are just preliminary, uh, but since we're kind of in a new ballpark, um, we wanted to make sure that you understood kind of how significant the changes have been. So uh, any other questions on this? Thank you, Mr. Hallmark. I think this is one of the more uh, joyous presentations we've received as a board <laughs> in quite some time. It's I certainly one of one, the more joyous that I've been able to give. Uh, which is not a, a, a word normally applied to our actuaries, but uh, <laughs> it is indeed appropriate in this case. Um, so thank you very much. W were there any other questions from trustees, members of the public? So hearing none, we'll move to the, to the next agenda item. And now we're stepping back to item 3B, which is discussion of the pension obligation bond by our CIO uh, accompanied by Makita and Veris. Um, so I don't know if uh, CIO Polani, would you like to address us first or yes. would that be Makita? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief. I know we have a time certain at 11, so we have 29 minutes left and Eileen will have the most comments uh, actually this morning on this presentation, Eileen Neal from Veris. Uh, but, you know, pension obligation bonds, uh, I think we've discussed this at this board uh, prior to this. Uh, the mayor put together a task force uh, a year or a year and a half ago. Uh, it was the retirement work uh, stakeholders working group. I believe that was the name. Both Roberta and I were members of that group, as were some council members and some trustees. And we looked at a variety of options to increase our funded ratio. POB was one of them. And uh, of course, when we had those discussions, uh, none of us anticipated that we'd have an additional $1.7 billion in investment gains between the two plans. Um, nevertheless, I think uh, it's quite commendable that uh, the mayor and the city uh, actually thought about this, thought about various options and uh, sort of among the various options discussed, uh, POB actually sort of trickled to the top. And, uh, and since then it's sort of taken a life of its own. There's been a lot of discussion at the city. And uh, so we will hear from the city later this morning at 11. Uh, but our job as a board and as an investment team is to, is to figure out 
you know, how to invest those proceeds. Uh, there's, there's the actuarial decision and Bill will help you with that. And there's the investment decision. And uh, it's, it's important to keep in mind uh, that there are a lot of unknowns at this point, um, whether the bonds will be issued, what the size of those bonds will be, uh, how much will come to the federated plan, and so on. It's also important to keep in mind that our annual contribution from the city, uh, with, uh, you know, both plans put together, is a big number. It's 400, 450 million. So, so if I I like to keep things simple, uh, we can do a lot of analysis on these things. But at the end of the day, if it's a small amount, uh, you know, the default would be we would just add this to our pool of assets, and we have an asset allocation in place, and that's how we'd manage this. Now, if it's, a, if it's a huge sum of money, much bigger than what we anticipate, uh, then of course, uh, you know, uh, we will then have to think through this a lot more because if it's a bigger pool of assets, uh, if there is a drawdown, uh, obviously we're gonna lose more money uh, depending on market volatility. Uh, so we've done a lot of work on this, uh, you know, on the advice of the police and fire board and Eileen and, and uh, Laura will, will share some of that. Um, but suffice to say that, uh, you know, it, this is important. And I think one of the best ways to increase a funded ratio is to put more money into the plan, regardless of the source. And so this is, this is a welcome contribution to the plan. And uh, we have to figure out how to invest this. Timing is everything in the market, as you know. Uh, if they had given us a billion dollars in March of 2020, I'd have gladly taken it. Um, today, as I had mentioned before, the Schiller PE is at 38. So to take that money and put it all into the equity market is a lot riskier now than it would have been in March 2020. Uh, but I'm sure our sponsor has thought through those issues and they will address that. And when when it's time for us to make a decision, of course, uh, you know we will we will uh, present a number of options uh, for the board to consider. Uh, with that, I'm actually going to turn this over to Laura. She'll make a few comments and then uh, hand it over to Eileen. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me and see the screen okay? Yes. Um, so yeah. Wonderful. So I, I think Prabhu already mentioned some of the information in terms of the background. Um, you know, all else being equal, you, you, you know, you'd have a, a decision to make about whether or not you just stick with the same asset allocation or modify it in some way if there were a large inflow. Um, uh, you know, to make an informed decision, there's additional data that we'll need around the size of the issue and how it's structured and the impact on future cash flows. Um, uh, you know, risk isn't sort of a linear function. Um, there's there's other factors around um, what the city can tolerate in terms of what risk level that you'd want to be at long term. So we we provided one um, per possible perspective here. Um, the uh, the thought being that if you were to allocate um, a hypothetical five hundred million dollar contribution to long term credit, that that might be a nice balance or the, um, the interest rate risk or the sort of um, the payment on the bonds that the city is taking on. Um, currently, the asset allocation has an expected return over the long term of 7.1% per year. If you were to sort of take from other asset classes um, and put an additional um, 10%, um, which is about 500 million um, into long-term credit, that would result in a long-term return of 6.7%. Um, um, some additional considerations though, I think, you know, one thing on sort of the behavioral side that we've we've all um, become aware of over the years is that um, even if your board and some of the stakeholders that are really close to the decision making make a decision to lower risk that makes sense given the city's specific sort of positioning, that doesn't mean that that other stakeholders, including possibly the city council, understand that that lower risk position will result in lower returns as well. Um, so it would be difficult to um, to sort of benchmark to peers um, in that case. Um, and as we know, um, you know, not keeping up with peers on the upside since markets do rise over time is one potential drawback of lowering the risk um, positioning of the plan. Um, there's also the question of how the money is invested if it were put into a separate sleeve 
Um, you may not get some of the, the fee aggregation um, benefits of having as many assets as you do currently. Then again, if you were to put all of the inflow into something like long-term credit, you likely could do that in sort of a passive index fund fashion that is, um, is low fee. Um, so that, that sort of sums up um, a few initial comments. And then I know that um, Eileen has um, a lot to share as well. I guess first I'd like to ask if any trustees have any questions at this juncture for Laura. Uh, none for me, Trustee Chandra. Okay, then let's move forward to the various presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great. And um, can you see my screen? And we can. Super. Uh, I apologize for not being on video. I am um, out of the office this week, and so I hope uh, I hope uh, my uh, uh, audio is sufficient. So uh, I, I recognize that we have um, limited time. So why don't we uh, go ahead and just jump into uh, slide two of our presentation? And the whole premise of our discussion is essentially to present a decision framework for you as a board as you are thinking about um, the uh, investment, the potential investment opportunity of receiving a significant amount of proceeds from a pension obligation bond. And so this slide two basically, basically provides a graphic representation of how you as the fiduciaries and decision makers should think about um, this type of a decision or any investment decision, frankly, where you're um, uh, trying to determine what the optimal um, policy allocation and risk exposure is. And so in, in our starting point is, is you have an asset allocation, you have a risk target cur currently of 12%, and that is reflective of an asset allocation that you believe is going to deliver a, an expected return equal or similar to your required rate of return, the 6.63%. And at that level of required return, your um, contributions are roughly uh, I think $200 million or so. And so the question is, um, do you maintain that current level or do you want to maintain that current level of risk exposure given that you're going to be receiving um, a large amount of proceeds or is this a time to potentially take some risk off the table because with additional funding, you may not need to take as much risk, but then that would have the effect of increasing your um, contributions from where they are currently. Now, you are really only um, supposed to be focused on the risk that you're taking, but you are, um, you take a number of different pieces of information into account when you're making that decision. And you work very closely with the city and you are sensitive as a board, I believe, sensitive to the volatility of the contributions that historically has been a variable that has been a component of your decision making process with respect to the asset allocation. So the the um, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand this a little bit. Are you you're putting out there that before we would bring a pension obligation in, we might look at our discount rate right, and balance it to what we think it should be because we did think about lowering it more. Uh, it's just such an impact, right? Correct. Um, and so we could get that aligned to a more, to a, a, what we, believed to be a realistic point in time 
And then with that data in hand, when the city makes the decision, they'll understand the true impact with and, and more updated discount rate. Correct. Exactly. Okay. All right. The, the city would probably have a better idea of potentially what that may mean to them as they mm -hmm. move forward with future contributions, and they would also be on the hook for the debt service obligation. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So in setting your current um, risk target, that, that was a function that was part and parcel of determining your required return, or your asset allocation objective, um, was understanding what the drawdowns that were associated with that risk level. And so, you know, I've highlighted on this slide, slide three, your current risk target is 12%. Um, and we know that at a 12% risk target, there is a chance um, that a worst case drawdown could occur of 20% and, and really all in a 20% drawdown um, and, and, and even beyond that could mean a 25% drawdown being the absolute bottom worst case. And, and so, you know, that information was recognized by you all and accepted as a condition of that 12% um, risk target. You can see that if you reduce that risk target, certainly that drawdown um, amounts or percentage decreases, but the percent of times that you may experience a drawdown increases. Um, conversely, if you decide you wanted to increase your risk exposure, um, the amount of times that you're going to um, face those those max drawdowns decreases, but the max drawdown amount increases. So those that's how you toggle that that target and how you think about that target. Okay. Can I ask another question? Sure. Okay. So on um, on the risk factor, is that something because that doesn't ring a bell for me, I'm sorry. Is that based on our asset allocation and that's determined because of that or is this something? Yes. Okay. No, the, 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 the asset allocation and the risk, they're kind of decided in tandem. And so, you know, you look at whenever you're looking at the returns, the expected return, you want to be thinking about the risk scenario associated with that expected return. And that's really how we kind of drive to the 12% because you looked at asset allocation scenarios that, you know, maybe could deliver um, higher returns, but then, you know, the 13%, the drawdowns associated with that were less attractive than those associated with the 12%, for example. And so if we wanted to lower our risk factor, we would need to change our asset allocation. Potentially, right? potentially, it depends. Uh, you know, a very, very small amounts you may not need to, but mm -hmm. a larger um, asset allocation shift, say 1% probably would, meet, would, in, would entail revisiting your risk target. Okay, all right, thank Ms. you. Neal? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, Trustee Horowitz. You yes, described Mr. Horowitz. Uh, twelve percent as a risk target. Uh, isn't that our risk ceiling uh, for the plan, and not our current target? It is. It is your. It, it is your um, ceiling. Correct. Um, and your 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 risk. You know, we do measure your actual risk, your expected risk, um, and we look at risk in a forward-looking basis. So we're, 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 we're making different risk, risk um, measurements when we're reporting to you on a quarterly basis, both ourselves and Nikita. Um, so you're correct. That is your risk maximum um, of 12%. And in fact, our current asset allocation is is targeting or anticipating a risk level much below that? Um, current risk levels are certainly lower. That's true. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can just add something. Yes, please. 
Uh, so uh, going back to Trustee Jennings' question and also to, to partly address your what the point that you raised. Uh, so this this uh, the 12% number uh, was a study. It, it came about as a result of a study that Makita did uh, sometime uh, in 2016 or 17. It predates me and many of us on this board. Uh, so Makita uh, Veris, uh, so Veris Veris actually uh, uh, interviewed uh, trustees at that point, uh, stakeholders, uh, city officials, and so on, and coming up with that 12% number. And so we, we've always treated that as uh, it's it's it is a it is an upper limit, but it's all it's also a target that we work towards, uh, depending on valuations and other you know market circumstances. And in March 2020, when we made the move, we came pretty close to that because we felt that you know uh, assets were cheap. Uh, so that's something that uh, to keep in mind. Uh, over the last several years, we've been considerably short of that target. Mm. Uh, we we did cl get closer to that target in March of 2020, and Eileen and I have spoken about this that it might be actually time to uh, do a you know revise that study that was done five years ago, and to revisit that 12 percent number. Might be a good idea. So right now, so that was kind of driving what our asset allocation and all that would be. And so when we made uh, the change um, recently, it was still within this 12%, um, right? Correct. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah, it's just that, you know, it's, it's something, you know, a lot of things are thrown at us. So, I mean, I don't know if I hold on to all of it. I just, you know, didn't remember that one. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. risk is, is such a difficult, uh, concept to grasp because it can be defined in so many different ways and yeah. just one simple easy way of looking at it but it's yeah. like, yeah. by no means the only way it works yeah yeah um thank you okay and, and, and importantly you know this risk is tied to the concept of drawdown which is uh i think very important to you as trustees so Can I have one more question when you sure. say drawdown what do you mean by that uh, a drawdown is a, um, a, 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 a distressed market scenario where we have um, returns outside of sort of normal day-to-day -day market variability. So as you could see, those negative 20 and negative 25%, we would call those drawdown scenarios. Day to day, we would expect um, any any time the markets to draw down, potentially up to maybe ten percent. We would not consider that an abnormal market environment. But an abnormal market environment, you know, a, re a negative return of twenty percent, twenty five percent, those are considered to be um, distressed market environments. Oh, okay. So this is where we hit various market. Um, exogenous variables you would say that come at you C correctly um, so, right? so the pandemic um yeah. you know produce this sort of environment 2008 Delta variant, you know whatever yes. you know any of these things that you just difficult to forecast correct okay Got but it. that have yeah. meaningful impacts on your uh, uh, yeah. contributions right right yeah. and your funded okay. status correct. yeah all right thank you you're welcome so if you think about that first draft and that framework, um, uh, first graph in that framework on slide four, um, we're actually looking at some different pension obligation bond scenarios, three different scenarios and, and compare those to our baseline. So the baseline being, you know, our current discount rate, 6.63%. And as we saw in the um, Chiron presentation, the, um, the the funded ratio up until this year was 62%. So if we got a $250 million pension obligation bond, that would improve our funded ratio to 68%. And we could potentially move to a 6.5% discount rate and maintain a similar contribution level to the current $200 million that Federated is paying. If we had a $500 million pension bond obligation that could increase our funded ratio to 73%, then we could entertain 
potentially a lower discount rate, again, if we want to keep our contributions not moving from where they are today, um, 200 million, 6.25%. And then lastly, a $1 billion uh, pension obligation bond would further improve our funded ratio, which you know could lead us to potentially um, consider a even lower discount rate assumption, again, maintaining that $200 million. So if you look at that $200 million line, it's at that, whatever that point is across those four lines, you're, you're kind of indifferent from an investment perspective. Now, from a city perspective, you might think, well, gee, you know, we may want to reduce our contributions, but that's not for you as a board to consider. For you as a board to consider is you don't want to maybe worsen the city's financial condition through your decisions, but, and, and, but you could improve your, um, uh, you know, your, your ability to produce, I'm sorry, to produce those expected returns by having a, um, a discount rate assumption that's easier to hit, if you will. So that's a way to think about this as you're thinking about um, uh, what to do with these proceeds. So on, on this slide, slide five, we're actually honing in more, and I apologize right away. We, we used a similar slide for police and fire, and we have police and fire text in here. I apologize for that. should say federated in the text. But here we're just focusing on the $500 million, again, to um, uh, more um, easily uh, show the decision framework, okay? So your baseline, the dark line, 6.63%, your 62% funded status. If you get a $500 million pension obligation bond, you could consider a, um, a, a lower, slightly lower discount rate assumption um, because your funded ratio would be 73%. Now we have two lines, one including debt repayment, excluding debt repayment. As we said, the city is on the hook for debt repayment. And so you can see that um, if, if you were to um, um, you know, take that into consideration, you, the city is essentially indifferent um, uh, at, at whether or not you um, uh, change the, the, the discount rate assumption, that really has no bearing on their ultimate outlay, if you will, um, given the current contribution rate and given that this would be a very modest decline potentially in the um, required rate of return. Um, here we're focusing on slide six on just the, the return side. As, as Laura just indicated, um, the expected return, at least when we did this presentation, it looks like they maybe updated their um, return assumptions. Um, it, on a 10-year perspective, the expected return was 5.9%. On a 20-year perspective, perspective, and that's more in line with how you should be thinking about your time horizon, the expected return was 6.8%, which was slightly higher than the discount rate of 6.625%. So you can see that, um, again, the pension obligation bond would enable you to potentially lower your discount rate assumption somewhat, um, although that would increase the contributions. If you were to lower your discount rate assumption to say the lower end of the Makita expected return 5.9%, your, your um, contributions would increase, you know, from 200, roughly 235 million to 260 million. And if you were to um, keep your expected return at the current level, um, then that would have the Im impact of roughly potentially decreasing your contributions if in fact you were to earn the 6.8%. So what these couple of slides we showed you have said 
you know, seem to indicate rather, is that, you know, you may not want to change, you may want to invest these proceeds at your current asset allocation, because that has the potential of not certainly increasing your contributions, could potentially decrease the contributions, and would enable you to keep um, a fairly reasonable uh, growth level. You know what the risk is associated with that. You've already determined, at least historically, that you were um, you found that to be an acceptable level of risk given the drawdowns, and we'll look at that in, at this next slide, slide seven. So, so on, on this slide, again, we're comparing the um, baseline, which is the dark line, to um, uh, the uh, baseline with the $500 million pension obligation bond. So um, that is the, it looks like the uh, teal line. So the dark line compared to sort of the teal line is the pension obligation bond baseline and the current baseline. The, the, the burgundy line is the baseline with no drawdown. The dark line is the baseline with the drawdown. Um, the orange line would be the pension obligation bond with the drawdown. So this shows us some a, a conclusion slightly different in that with the um, higher dollar amount going into the fund, this actually could be a negative from a drawdown perspective. And, and you think about it this way, you have a higher dollar amount that you would lose during that drawdown scenario. So a 25% drawdown on $100 is $25. A 25% drawdown on $200 is you know, $50. So the absolute dollar amount is greater. So again, from, from your perspective, because you're just focused on investing the assets, that should, you should be indifferent to that. But from the city's perspective, that actually worsens the city's financial condition because they've got the debt service, plus there's a larger dollar amount that then um, feeds into the calculation of the normal cost. So that is the one, um, uh, uh, additional consideration, you know, at least maybe from the city's perspective that I don't know if they thought about this, but if you do have a pension bond obligation and, um, uh, you know, you don't change your risk profile, you keep the same expected return, or even if you change your risk profile, it doesn't matter. In either situation, the city is going to be slightly worse off in a drawdown situation because of the additional debt service that they're also on the hook for. So, so the, really that concludes our slides. What we wanted to do again was to lay out a framework so that when you do have greater clarity as to what the city is going to do and what that um, potential amount of that pension obligation bond is going to be, then you understand what your toggles are. Essentially, you want to look at um, how you should or if you should be changing your expected return or the asset allocation associated with that expected return and what um, that may mean in terms of impact on funded status and contributions. Because while that should not be an explicit consideration for you as investment decision makers, you do care, you do want to make decisions that are in the best interest of your participants and scenarios that become economically untenable for the city put uh, basically everything at risk, right, with respect to the plan structure and so forth. And so 
we know that you're very cognizant and very sensitive to um, how the financial condition of the city may change from your decisions. And that's why we believe this framework is the right framework for you to think to employ. And we would work with you as well as Nikita through this decision making process. So hopefully, hopefully you found this helpful. This is Trustee Jennings again, and one more. On the um, debt repayment, um, is that more for the city to consider? Because yes. we're not paying, yeah. No. That we're paying that back. Correct, correct. We're, we're concerned with the money going into the pension and the investment of it. Correct. And hopefully, hopefully not getting drawdowns, but of course the world is not always nice, so. Okay, all right, I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Neal. Uh, we'll open it up to any other questions from trustees. And uh, those are addressed to this entire agenda item that is Veris, Makita, and the CIO on, on this group of presentations. Are there any questions from other trustees or from Trustee Jennings as well? N none from me, Trustee Harwood. This is Trustee Chandra. Right, thank you. None from me either. Very good. Um, I did have one question. Sure. And going back to the Mikita presentation, they offered us one scenario of how the asset allocation might change. And they imagined essentially putting the full amount of the POB into long-term credit. I'll let uh, Laura share her screen. Right. I think that was a slide or two, and there we go. Um, so long-term credit, how are you distinguishing that from either long-term bonds or investment-grade bonds? Sure, so long-term credit has a duration, I think, of around 15 years, whereas investment-grade bonds has a duration of around six years. Um, and um, we have two separate assumptions, one for long-term credit and one for long-term government bonds. Um, which are generally um, uh, treasuries and agencies, so U.S. government, not municipal government. So the yield on long-term credit um, is going to be a bit higher than long-term governments. And, and what would that yield be currently? Um, I looked it up when we were putting this together. I think it's in the about a 3% range. 3%. So that would be, uh, comparing it to the debt burden of the POB, it would be a, close to a wash. Exactly, that was the intention. I see, okay, thank you. Again, any other trustee questions on this agenda item 3B? Any public comment or questions? Well, hearing none, let's move to the next order of business, which is our third time certain POB presentation from city staff, this is item 4D, as in David. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, city staff is actually logged in to the meeting. Uh, I think city staff is led by the Director of Finance, Julia Cooper, and my peer at the Deferred Com uh, Committee, and uh, Julia and the rest of the city staff, welcome to the meeting. I'll just turn it over to uh, your group. Good morning. Good morning. Julia, you are you are mute, so that's what we can't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to stay mute during earlier so you didn't hear all my paper shuffling. So anyway, so again, thank you this morning for having us come make this presentation to the board. I have with me today Nikolai Skarloff, who's our Deputy Director of Debt and Treasury Management, and Cheryl Parkman, who's Assistant to the City Manager in Employee Relations. Jim's on vacation this week, so he's not um, participating, but he's obviously here in spirit as well. 
And then we have uh, the uh, Urban Futures is uh, the municipal advisor to the city as we've been looking at pension obligation bonds. So we have Michael, Julio, and Wing C here that will be helping us make the presentation today and answer questions as well. So we have um, on the next slide, we have kind of the agenda. We're kind of talk about the challenge, kind of the city goals and policy considerations that we at the staff level are starting to consider and mull around as we um, get ready to make some additional um, presentations to our city council. And then um, UFI will talk about, you know, pension obligation bonds, kind of what we like to call 2.0. Um, and then some final considerations and then open it up to any questions that you have. So just some general kind of opening comments and um, Parbu mentioned this earlier that the mayor did form the um, in March of 2019, the Retirement Stakeholder Solutions Working Group. And a number of us were members of, of that group. And um, they issued their final report in April of 2021. And um, also this council held a study session in April as well, a very extensive study session that lasted nearly four hours and had a slide deck in excess of 100 slides. So it was, it was pretty intense and it did kind of start the framework as we move through and kind of consider all the alternatives for us um, moving forward in terms of dealing with the unfunded liability. So um, we've, over the course of probably the better part of a decade or a decade and a half, the city has been looking at ways to deal with our unfunded liability and looked at a number of options. As you know, we now have a tier two plan in place in both uh, federated and police and fire. Um, but as we go through those, all of those options, we really see um, pension obligation bonds as pretty much the last tool in the toolbox that we have to kind of evaluate that. So we kind of want to talk with you a little bit about kind of the things that we're looking at. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Cheryl for a couple of slides. Thanks so much, Julia. Good morning, everybody. I, I, I'm sure most of you remember me from, from other meetings, Cheryl Parkman, Office of Employee Relations. And one of the things that we wanted to start off talking to you about today is the city, uh, the Federated City Employees Retirement System funding ratio, which as of June 30th, 2020 was 52% funded. Now we, we just saw Bill Hallmark present really, really interesting results based on last year's investment returns, which improved uh, the funding status on an actuarial basis to 55%. But we wanna show you this slide because there are two really important things to the city that we want to focus on today. One is that the actuarial of assets is value of assets is what the city really focuses on because that's where the contributions for the city come from. You know, when we, when we see the huge increase in that market value of assets, that's great. But when we get the bill from the, from the actuary and from the retirement system, what we see is actually that, a, that AVA. And the second thing that we really want to focus on is this funded status. Now, it was 52% funded as of last year and increased to 55% this year. But 55% still really leaves us on this, this precipice of needing to make some big changes in order to increase this funding status. And as Julia mentioned, we, for the past decade, have been really trying to find ways to increase this funded status. So uh, something that we're really focusing on, if you look at other agencies in our, in our universe, we see that others, you know, uh, are a little bit better funded than us, and we do want to compare, at, you know, the same systems, apples, apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. But when we see that 55% number, it really does make us feel like we need to do something. So if we can go to the next slide, seeing is that, you know, back in, in 2020, when we were looking at these, uh, these payments, they were increasing, they are a, a you know, a big, a big part of budget. And, and we can see that with the investment returns from last year, that is decreasing. However, we still want to make sure that we're focusing on the fact that, uh, and as Roberto very eloquently put it earlier today, all of the assumptions need to be met in order for that dotted blue line to really come into place. If we change assumptions, if we change the discount rate, well, those green bars can come uh, creeping back up. And the other thing we really want you to focus on with these particular slides is that that funding status still is indicating over a hundred million dollars of, uh, of contributions from the city in those years. So we need to make sure that we're getting to a healthy funded status so we can start to you know, make sure 
that that dotted blue line is what we see, not those not those green bars. So um, with that, I think what we also want you to know is this next slide, and I'll pass it back over to Julia. Thank, thank you, Cheryl. So um, you know, and as we've talked about before, we've made several presentations to the board about the city's budget and the credit and how the rating agencies look at it. And the city is a strongly rated city. We're one notch below the highest rated category. We have the strong credit considerations that the rating agencies look at as our reserves, our liquidity, the economic strength of the city and its diverse tax base an ex exceptionally strong executive management team that especially focuses in on budget with five-year forecasting. And that five-year forecasting does look at what our pension contributions are be. And the history of you know, fiscal responsibility that you know, we have, the city has made hard budget decisions over you know, decades in terms of keeping our budget in balance. But that's not to say that those credit concerns don't come through from the rating agencies and looking at our pension OPED liability, you know, and they, they identify it in nearly every single credit report that those high fixed costs and the leverage. So it's something that we need to, to think about so that we can maintain those high ratings because those high ratings are important to keep our overall borrowing costs down. And so when they, you know, each of the rating agencies have different metrics that they look at. And um, you know they they basically focus in on you know plans that are under eighty percent funded warrant greater scrutiny. So they do put us under a higher microscope with respect to how they look at that. So the next part of the thing we want to kind of just talk about is the city goals and policy considerations and the approaches that we're looking at from a staff perspective as we move through forward in this. Um, this uh, sea of unknown, so to speak, and issuing pension obligation bonds. So in terms of the city goals, you know, I think it's important to remember that our goals are fundamentally aligned between the retirement plans and the city. We want to ensure the long-term stability of the city's retirement systems. I know that's a goal for you, and that's a goal for us as well. So while obviously we don't control those investments, we're legally obligated to pay the liability to both systems. So we have an interest in maintaining this, you know, the, the sustainability of the plans. So we want to improve the funding ratio for the federated plan, which is low, and uh, design it so that it has you know, sustainable funding ratios. Um, also, we want to reduce the annual burden of the unfunded, the UAL, on all city funds, particularly the general fund. So one thing that's unique and a little bit different between the two retirement plans is police and fire, their retirement contributions are almost 100% coming from the general fund. But on the federated side, it's only about 45% of the funding comes from the general fund. So, for, you know, for every dollar that the city saves overall in pension contributions, about 45 cents of it benefits the city. Um, general fund. And we also want to prevent those contributions from rising what was projected through 2029 based on the actuarial returns from 2020. And then also we're looking at ways that maybe we can use savings to accelerate the amortization of the unfunded liability, this concept of recycling. So if we were to issue pension obligation bonds and that reduced our annual contribution, you know, by an X dollar amount, instead of necessarily providing all of that money back into providing services, maybe that we would develop a policy that percentage of those would then essentially go to pre-fund the contribution. Kind of if you think about when you, you know, do a refinancing of the mortgage on your house, what do you do with those savings? Um, one of those ways is to ex essentially keep your payment the same in order then to reduce the time frame in which you have to pay off your mortgage. So a way for the city to think about what we would do with POB funding savings. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nikolai and um, he'll continue with the presentation. Uh, good morning. Uh, whether the city issues POBs or not, as a matter of best practice, the city plans to develop updated pension funding policies that modify existing policies and adopt some new ones. The council has multiple options for funding its pension uh, contributions. POBs are just one of them. So we expect these updated policies will address all of these. For example, the city already has a robust debt policy. Um, that has been adopted by the city council. And that addresses how and when we refinance our bonds, our debt, and how we structure the term of those bonds. The city also has robust policies on how we address budget surpluses and, and one-time money. But just as we have debt policies for our bonds, these pension funding 
funding policies will address the city's UIL liability and contributions as the largest of our uh, fixed obligations and how POBs would be approached if and when council authorizes POBs. Now, credit rating agencies, as Julia mentioned, who evaluate the city's uh, bonds um, certainly evaluate pension funding policies as part of that when they rate any POBs, but they're already considering uh, the UAL and the retirement system funding status as part of their existing rating to the city. And as uh, Julia alluded to, um, the fact that the retirement uh, obligations loom large in our city ratings already. Um, Moody's uh, cites high fixed costs and leverage as one of the city's credit challenges uh, when we issue bonds and under factors that could lead to an upgrade in the city's already high rating, they specifically list a material decrease in the city's unfunded pension and OPEB liability. So these policies would be approved by council, but some of the key points that we would expect to address before any POBs are included um, would be how much, how would the savings be used and recycled as Julia mentioned to accelerate the funding of the pension liability? How would the term of the refinancing compare to the liability that's being refinanced? And this is where being able to line up amortization of different UAL bases and comparing them to debt amortization is so important. And our municipal advisors will be discussing that shortly. And we would expect that these policies would highlight that POBs would only be used for refinancing UAL and not normal costs. Turning to the next uh, slide, as many of you already know better than I do, the city's been working to address unfunded pension liabilities for going on 15 years now. And this has included implementing a number of strategies and considering and rejecting many more. In many ways, as Julia mentioned, POBs are the last tool in the city's toolbox. This isn't our first tool to be pulled out. And it's really the last and best way for the city to make an appreciable change in a multi-billion dollar UAL. Now, while it's true that there are other cities around the country who have used POBs to fund normal costs or have done it as a strategy to produce budget relief, the city has earned its high credit ratings from all three credit rating agencies by being prudent and conservative stewards of its finances. And we expect the funding uh, policies for pensions to be adopted by council to reflect the same approach. <clears throat> While the boards and council have different duties and responsibilities, the one in which they're wholly aligned is wanting a healthy funding status of each retirement plan. Because no matter what the council ultimately decides to do with POBs, it will still be funding the liabilities with or without POBs. Because the boards and councils each have different duties and responsibilities, the benefits and risks of POBs are different for the board and for the city council. Only the city council will authorize and issue the bonds and only the council will be responsible for paying the bonds. But from a board perspective, the POBs will pro provide a large infusion of cash as we've been hearing this morning already in prior presentations. Either all at once or over time, if the city chooses to issue in, in multiple tranches. As I think Prabhu alluded to earlier, imagine what this board could have done with another 250 million or 500 million or more of cash over the past year. It will also increase the funding ratio of each plan. And by replacing that IO, IOU, the UAL, with cash, the plans will have less reliance on annual city contributions. As we discussed at length in our city council meeting, we had a, a four hour study session in April. All financings introduce different elements of risk and certainly true for POBs as well. And we covered those at length in April. But most of those risks are risks borne by the city, not by the board. The biggest issues that the city has and the ones in which both parties' interests are aligned is that the city will borrow the funds, the board would invest the funds, and if the board can't invest the funds or doesn't earn the average rate over the life of the bonds um, that exceeds the rate of the bonds, the city will pay more because the city's obligation to fund the plan is never extinguished. But as you will hear shortly, 
uh, we are in a unique market situation where interest rates are incredibly low. Cities are borrowing POBs for well under 3% this summer. So the barrier to success is particularly low now, and that's why many uh, POBs are being issued. We would lock in those low rates for the life of the bond. The other key risk uh, related to that is market timing risk, as we were discussing a little uh, uh, shortly uh, before this uh, discussion. Ultimately, the city strategy only succeeds if the federated board is successful in investing these funds. And that is why it's been clear in all of our discussions with council that this type of dialogue is important. While council has its role and the board has its role, both are only successful if there's a coordination and dialogue. And that's why we're having the discussions like this and then the joint meeting with council and the two boards in late September. And with that, I'd like to introduce the city's municipal advisor who were retained early in 2021 to help us evaluate various pension funding strategies, including POBs. So let me turn this over to our advisors at Urban Futures Incorporated who are joining us today. Thank you, Nikolai. Next slide, please. So when we are evaluating the economics of issuing pension obligation bonds to improve the funding status of plans and reduce the UAL, we start with modeling the payment schedule for each amortization base that stacks up to the aggregate UAL. Each amortization base can essentially be viewed as an outstanding obligation with individual payment schedules at 6.625%. So the aim is to replace all or some of those individual obligations with pension obligation bonds at a lower interest cost than 6.625% and improve funding status of plans. Next slide, please. So by way of background, the POV market has evolved substantially since their inception almost three and a half decades ago to what we now like to call POVs 2.0. GASB 68, for example, required government agencies to move pension liabilities from a narrative discussion in the notes section of financial statements directly onto balance sheets, often resulting in the carrying of a large liability on the books and compelling public agencies to pay a much higher level of attention and analysis on pension liabilities. So cities with strong management and strong leadership like San Jose have been creating meaningful plans to address rising pension costs, as Julia alluded to earlier, including pension reform, developing and adopting a pension obligation funding policy, evaluating multiple funding strategies, and performing extensive scenario and market and timing risk analysis to fully understand the risks of POVs before deciding to proceed. Next slide, please. Public agencies are recognizing POVs 2.0 as an opportunity to take advantage of historically low taxable borrowing rates to increase funding of the retirement plans. These issuers are not turning to POVs to kick the can down the road by extending new AL payments or borrowing to pay for normal costs to plug gaping budget deficits. They aren't taking any unnecessary risks by issuing POVs with complex debt, debt instruments like non-callable bonds or using derivatives. They're issuing plain vanilla fixed rate bonds that are callable at par in 10 years. And POVs 2.0 are typically structured with level debt service rather than escalating debt service of prior generation POVs, which creates budget stability and creates some room to absorb future pension liabilities. Next slide, please. These highly rated credits coming to market with POBs 2.0 have increasingly regained the confidence of investors and generated strong demand for POBs. So this slide reflects a five-year POB issuance trend. And as you can see, due to favorable market conditions, there's been a significant uptick in the issuance of POBs last year and this year, a majority of which are California issuances. Again, these are largely strong credits utilizing POBs as a tool that is part of a comprehensive and proactive approach to addressing pension liabilities. So by way of reference, uh, Buena Park AA plus credit sold POBs yesterday with a final maturity of 2043 at a true interest cost of 2.36%. Now the barn rate is one critical aspect of we've, as we've discussed this morning, but the other critical aspect involves the investment performance of the pension obligation bonds as we've also been discussing this morning which my colleague Julio will describe in more detail. Julio? Thank you, Wingsy. Um, one of the key issues or one of the focuses that we had in our first in-depth analysis was looking at how we would address the liabilities. 
And as the actuarial reports that, um, that Chiron provides, they have base selections that essentially mark to market or true up your liability each and every year. So we take those as a series or we create a, a model that models out the payments that, that uh, determines your payment stream. And there are long bases and short bases. So what we had done is strategically looked at those bases to try to uh, manage the payment schedule. So addressing or paying off a short base would reduce uh, the impact, the near-term budgetary impact. On the other hand, if you looked at a longer base, it would maximize total savings. So one of the things we had looked at is that, that strategy of being able to selectively target the bases and then hopefully change our repayment stream, assuming, of course, that we would do a partial POB. So you would have a POB to select some and then the remainder. So that was the notion of how we had gone through our preliminary analysis. Next slide, please. In addition to that, we looked at extensively the cost of capital or the opportunity cost, namely that if you were to apply cash, you would apply that towards the longest basis because there's no interest payment for that. Then we had strategies called tax exempt exchange or leverage funding that would have a next cost of capital. And finally, we'd look to push forward the pension obligation bonds to reduce the carrying costs. So we looked at this once again in a very strategic manner, trying to minimize the cost of carry for the city. Next slide. But at the end of the day, I think what's different now between POB, the prior uh, issuance of POBs and POBs now is we clearly understand the risk. So we, we do more in-depth study and really bifurcate the process. The first, is POBs on one side are a simple refinancing, taking a 6.625 liability and cutting nearly that cost in half, if not more, as far as the total cost of interest, right? Because the your amortization bases are essentially loans at the discount rate. So if the discount rate is 6.625, the amortization basis or the repayment schedule for the UAL is set at that rate. And the POBs allow you to refinance at a far cheaper rate. What makes a POB so different from a traditional refinancing is that that money then is placed with your fund, and then at minimum you have to exceed the rate of ret the rate of return on those P uh, on those invested funds must exceed the rate on the bonds. That's a that's kind of a, an oversimplification, however. So we actually go and do far more in-depth analysis. And at the end of the day, what's really critical is the investment return in the initial years. Why, as, as I, the prior presentations were talking about, and I think they talked about a drawdown schedule, we term that really as leverage. If you are giving $500 million more, as, as Nikolai also stated, you could do so much more on an upward market and, of course, the downward market. So we're really concerned about the risk of pension obligation bonds, especially what happens in the initial few years and if you have a downward trend or a downward return. So next slide, please. Once again, we talked about how market timing is so critical. And even though in the past, people over, overly simplified and said, oh, as long as the rate of return exceeds the rate on the pension obligation bonds, you'll end up better off. We looked at it and said, no, in reality, you could have two almost identical returns, but how and when you receive those returns is what's really critical to the outcome. And I believe that's one of the components when, when you look at this is how clearly the city now understands the risks at hand with pension obligation bonds. They aren't simple axioms that they're using, but looking at strategically placing the bases and also understanding how critical market timing is to the final outcome of the POB. Next slide. So, I believe that's you, Julia, correct? No. Oh, it's still me, okay. So as we said, the market timing risk or the critical component has two elements that you can actually do to mitigate that risk. One, which is a common investment strategy, is a notion of dollar cost averaging, which is the notion of issuing bonds over time, the downside to that, or, and making comparable investments into the fund. So from the city's perspective, they issue multiple tranches or a series every year, for example, 
And then from your side, you're making investments over time. And hopefully that would average out the returns. And another is some type of hedge. Um, and that would be something that you could implement on your side. Um, we looked at the cost of hedges and they are very expensive. Um, you know, there are alternative strategies. So one of the things we looked at in reality, what's easy for the city to implement without being able to, uh, without being able to impact the hedging side is to just issue multiple strategies for more than one series or a limited amount of deals. Uh, another way of looking at that also is the larger the size of the pension obligation bond, the greater the leverage factor. And that's one of the reasons the city has been very specific about not wanting to do a pension obligation bond for the full amount. Okay, they, thank you. Thank you, Nikolai, or Julio and Nikolai. He did the presentation earlier. So just um, in some final considerations and then to open it up for questions, um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, as we go to the next slide, our interests and goals are really aligned. We wanna have a positive impact for the city and reduce that UAL and improve our funding status. You know, obviously the city's concerned about the rising, potentially rising contributions through fiscal 29, and which then in turn kind of erodes our capacity for other city programs and services. Since it's a bill that we receive from you every year, and it's the bill that we put at the top of the pile that needs to get paid, so to speak. So, you know, we've also talked about using a portion of any savings that we would uh, realize to essentially put back into amortizing the unfunded liability and also looking at easing some of the current budget pressure, pressures. And then obviously the positive impacts for the retirement plans, you know, as um, Parvu talked about earlier in terms of, you know, that large infusion of cash to make new investments. And, you know, whether we do that all at once or over time, those are all important considerations for us. And then ultimate goal of increasing the funding level for the plans. And then you, um, and then also you, the plans having a reduced reliance on city contributions. So this page just kind of shows the alignment of those roles and responsibilities between the, the plans and the city. You know, it's, it's up to the city to determine our funding strategy and policies to fund the UAL and, and our responsibility to make those annual contributions to the plans. And obviously your roles and responsibilities are, you know, investing those proceeds and meeting your benchmarks, thinking about your asset allocation and setting your own internal policies. And at the end of the day, we help those come together to improve the funded status for the plan. So then in summary, I just want to give you kind of the kind of the next steps and the presentations. We obviously are here today in front of the Federated Board and we'll do a very similar presentation to the police and fire um, board in September. Then on the 21st of September, we have a council meeting uh, where we will be they will be considering proceeding with the judicial validation, and we will provide them kind of a summary of the of the meetings we've had with the two retirement boards. And then on September 30th is the date that we have the joint meeting between the two boards and the city council. And then we will be continuing to work on the timing for a council meeting to adopt the policy and the continuation of the analysis of the POB scenarios. So there's still a lot of variables to come in. And part of the big unknown is how long that judicial validation process will take um, because we can't um, be in a position to issue pension obligation bonds until the validation is complete. So we expect that to take us um, into 2022 before we have that in hand. So with that, we're available to um, answer any questions. Thank you uh, to all the presenters for, for this uh, presentation, very comprehensive. So we'll open it up to trustees if they have any questions. Uh, but however, maybe I'll start with a question of my own, uh, which may clarify some of where our questions are going is, what is it that the city staff is looking to the pension boards either today or in the future on September 30th, are you looking for us to have a vote to um, a vote of support for your strategy for pension obligation bonds? Are you looking for us to commit to an asset allocation plan or a risk mitigation plan? What specifically is being asked of the boards? So 
I, I think I think one of the variables that's important in our analysis in terms of moving forward is to understand if you would have a different asset allocation um, based on the receipt of pension obligation bonds. Is is your thinking of how those funds would be invested different based on different kind of ranges of what those proceeds may look like in terms of when they come in? Um, because those are all important in terms of our analysis relative to what that spread's going to be, right? In terms of thinking about, um, you know, how much the pension um, obligation bond and the earnings that may happen subsequent to that would impact our UAL going forward. And then also, you know, as Julio mentioned, this concept that, you know, the UAL is built as essentially a stack of 42 different amortizations for the federated plan. And would we be able to kind of, you know, say, okay, we want to pay off, you know, basis number 37 or, or whatever, because it creates the best um, liability for us. Much the way we look at when we do refundings of bonds, we look at those um, series of bonds that um, impact us most in terms of creating savings. So um, Nikolai or, or Wingsing, did you want to add anything else to that? Well stated. Wait. Those are the two main variables that we are. Yeah. At. And we, we will be working with, um, with Roberto and Parbu to set the agenda for the 30th. So, you know, um, so that we kind of have clear, clear some clear, hopefully, outcomes uh, with respect to that, that meeting. Um, so, Mr. Chair and Julia, just to your comments, uh, let me just say that uh, in terms of uh, the investment side of that equation, obviously, we will have to have discussions with our CIO and investment consultants, but I think we have mentioned this to you before, Julia. I think um, how we're going to deploy any proceeds, any potential um, changes or thoughts on the asset allocation going forward, will depend greatly on understanding um, what is the amount that the city is considering, right? Because there's two parts to this. First of all, we do get your armor contributions every year on July 1st, that's sizable. Mm -hmm. And then there's a difference between um, if the city is considering issuing a total of 500 million in POVs of which say there's a 60-40 split between Fed and police and fire, that's one approach. But if the city is just uh, issuing 100 million or on the other side of that equation, a billion dollars, then we may want to have a different consideration in terms of how we're going to deploy those proceeds. So um, I, I think the boards and staff understand the city's question, uh, but it's sort of like a catch-22. We are be, we're in a better position to answer some of those questions once we have a, a, an idea as to the amount of that uh, those proceeds. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but yeah, it's from it, a business standpoint. It, it, it's almost like we're chasing each other, right? We want to know how you're going to treat the money. You want to know how much we're going to give you. So I think what it's going to involve is some sitting down and some conversations and some you know scenario analysis between your staff and our staff to kind of figure out you know, kind of what are the levers and what are, you know, kind of the best ways, you know, for to benefit the plan and to benefit the city as well. So, so I think we're going to have to spend some time kind of doing, doing that sensitivity analysis as a team between our respective staff and consultants to um, kind of understand if it's, if it's under this amount, kind of this is where we are. If it's over this amount, this is kind of the space that we're in. And then we can look at that based on where the market is with respect to our borrowing costs, right? So um, so I think that's going to be part of the whole kind of iterative process we're going to need to work through as we move um, through the decision-making process. Julia, I might just add uh, to the chair's uh, a specific question. I, I think uh, we, we come to you today not not intending to leave with any decisions. This was really intended as a briefing to you in anticipation of the, the board's meeting with council uh, to have that dialogue. And I, I think you can appreciate that normally when the city refinances a bond, uh, we issue new bonds with lower rates than the old bond. The old bonds go away and 
we can say upfront what our savings are with a pension obligation bond since the city retains that uh, liability forever um, uh, we we rely on the success of the investment side as well and that's why we think this this dialogue is so important because in essence what the council would be doing is borrowing and, and assuming a liability for bonds and then handing the proceeds to the board to invest and so of course the, the council is uh, going to certainly be interested um, in knowing how you you intend to invest those funds so uh, we've recognized the chicken and egg and that's why we want to have this kind of dialogue this is trustee jennings and as i try to understand um if we have I mean, you need to pay back the bonds. I mean, you, you're paying interest on it. You have to at least pay back that, right? And is how are you paying that back? Are you paying it back by having lower contribution to uh, the retirement? Or is it, are we transferring you um, the investment savings, which normally we feed back into our investments so uh, would those then be kind of um portioned off so that gives you the ability to pay off i mean how's how's that work i'm, I'm a little confused uh, julie it's um this is julia it it's a it's a it's a fixed obligation that we would have in the budget um, in the case of the federated plan um, it would be spread across the various funds and it would be just considered um, essentially if we were spending, you know, two, three hundred million dollars a year is what our, you know, paying for the UAL, then this would just, this would just reduce it up. We would be paying a portion to the pension plan and a portion to our debt service. And the expectation is that the combination of those two would be lower than what we're paying today. So okay. it's a budget. Well, it would stay. Yeah, so, it's a budget. But, yeah, they would stay, but the budget thing and that would go lower. And, and if you're doing the trenching, is that where you're gonna have the obligation, you know, the money out there, cause you're gonna lock in this rate. And so the city would lock in this rate, but then not provide it to the board for investing except on interim basis. No, what it means is, is that it say, say, say over the course of a 10 year period of time, we wanted to do, a billion dollars worth of POBs, but we didn't want to take all of the market risk associated with your reinvestment risk all at once. Mm -hmm. So we did it at 250 million, a, you know, every other year, right? Mm -hmm. Then that would be, and then we would have, our fixed costs would be the time, be determined our debt service at the time we entered the market. So if we did one in 22, it would be market rate in 22. We did one in 24, it would be whatever the interest rates were in the market in 24. So that, that's the concept. So that's the dollar cost averaging. So you're not essentially taking all the reinvestment risk to the plans up front that you would spread it out over time. And then the but city- you are locking in that low- um, No, we would- right. Oh, you're not? No, you only at the time you actually sell the bonds. So if you, if oh. the city had a plan to do a billion dollars, and I'm just making up numbers. Yeah, right? yeah, I know. This. If we said we wanted to do a billion dollars mm. and we wanted to split it up, it would, our costs would be determined at the time we entered the market and issued each piece oh. of those to get to a billion dollars. So the rate could be going up. Yes. Yeah. And then that would determine the city's decision whether to issue or not. I see. And if interest rates were going up on our side, we would assume theoretically that inter that retain returns were going up on your side as well. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of hands up. Uh, I believe first was uh, council liaison uh, uh, Davis. If you please go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to address your question, Chair Horowitz, about what we're looking for from the boards. I will tell you as a council member, I. It appears to me today that the conversation that the board is having and the conversation that that city staff are having are two completely different conversations. The assumption that the city staff is making is that we would, it, it's basically it's very different than what Varys is telling you, you have a choice 
And what I wrote down was you could choose to keep the discount rate the same and lower contributions. City staff is assuming that that is what you are going to do so that we can pay back the pension obligation bonds with money that we would be paying normally for with contributions. That's the assumption that's being made. If you are going to choose to keep contributions the same and lower the discount rate, I as a council member and the rest of the council absolutely need to know that because whether or not we do pension obligation bonds at all depends on that decision. That is the one key decision we absolutely have to know before we move forward with POBs. Okay, thank you. That's very clarifying. And uh, uh, Council uh, Chen, you also have your hand raised. Hi, yes, thank you for this. Um, so I just wanted to uh, address the board and remind them of their uh, fiduciary duties when considering the uh, pension obligation bonds. One of their duties is first and foremost is their duty of loyalty to the members. And so whatever decision that the board decides to do with the money should the um, POB issue and we receive the funds is to consider how to apply and use those funds for the best interest of the members. Um, while we can consider uh, the city's position, our primary duty is to the members, though we do have also a duty of prudence to apply the, that asset um, from the POBs in a way that would ensure the competency of the, the fund. So I, the reason why I bring this up is I know there's a lot of focus on the impact to the city, but for the board's perspective as fiduciaries, um, our perspective is for the, the, the health of the fund and for our members. Uh, thank thank you. you, Council. Um, do we also have a duty, perhaps a secondary one, um, to consider the financial health of the plan sponsor? Sorry, yes, we do. Um, so the duty of loyalty um, is a complicated one because the pension fund is intergenerational. And so we have obligations to retired members as well as active members. Um, for the active members that are currently employed by the city, we do have a fiduciary duty of loyalty to ensure that they have continued employment. So if we take a course of action and apply those funds in a way that may bankrupt the city or negatively impact the city's ability to keep people in payroll, that would factor into our duty of loyalty to the members. Understood. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Um, again, opening it to uh, other trustee questions and comments. Mr. Chair, yes, I just wanted to uh, address to the extent possible, I think the comments by Council Member Davis, um, we certainly understand, um, you know, the question and understand how critical is the answer to that question in the whole decision making <clears throat> from the city standpoint. Um, and I know we're going to have the joint meeting between the boards and the council scheduled for next month, September 30th. Um, that discussion on, on the uh, assumed rate of return or discount rate, the boards have that discussion with Chiron every year during the valuation process, which usually kicked off in the October through December. Uh, my experience, and I just wanna qualify this publicly. My experience has been, and I'm not speaking for the boards here, um, is that the boards uh, started a, a, a plan a few years ago um, to decrease that uh, assumed rate return slowly but surely. Uh, and for the last few years, they, they have uh, decreased the rate uh, at two and a half basis points every year or two. Um, so my take on it is that, again, I'm not trying to suggest the board will do this. And I want to make it clear that even if this discussion is held at the joint meeting, um, just like I think you have mentioned in the past, me, Davis, when the, the boards ask questions to council members and council members sort of speak on their own about how the views are, uh, it's harder. That's very difficult in terms of comparing that statement compared to what the full council view is. The same with the boards. You may hear some trustees with some views on a matter, but then we have to be careful to make sure that we speak. And, and get an approval from the full board at their regularly scheduled meetings later this year. 
Um, and so I, I will say it's very likely they will have that discussion. And it's also likely that given the, the return on the market uh, this year and the fact that as, as, as the market has become a little more um, challenging and also uh, expensive, uh, that they may, they may, and I just quantify that, they may decide to decrease uh, the discount rate, uh, whether it's this year or the following year. Uh, I'm not even sure to what extent. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I guess my whole point here is to say that um, we will not know the answer to those questions until later this year. I would say at the earliest it will be possibly November uh, unless Kygon is able to provide all scenarios early in the year uh, on the evaluations. And this year, the whole process is also complicated by the fact that uh, every five years, the whole actual process go through an audit. And this is the year, the 2025 fiscal year, where Kygon will be doing the regularly scheduled evaluation approach. And then Seagull will be conducting the audit of the evaluation process. So, I just sort of wanted to to make that point uh, that we understand the question. We certainly understand how critical it is to understand the answer to the question, but that uh, answers will not be available until some time. And and I would say it is it is possible. Again, I'm not speaking for the boards that if they do decide to decrease the discount rate going forward over the next few years, they may take two or three different dips to it in the next you know five or six years or so. Thank you. So my point, Roberto, was not that the discount rate would never change. The question that I have as a council member and that I would think that my colleagues would need to know is if an infusion of the POB money would change the, the outlook on the discount rate for this board. Because if it would change, I, I as a council member need to know what that how that changes the thinking of this board because if they're going to accelerate the step down of the assumption of the assumed rate of return i need to know that because what we're paying for the pension obligation bond whether we pay two and a half percent or three percent or three and a half percent the only way this works is if the assumed rate of return is measurably higher than that and that you're able to hit it if you keep lowering it, that increases the risk that you're not going to be able, that we don't have that arbitrage. That's, that's what I'm saying. So I, I understand and that there's not, and that what, what, what I would prefer is that there would be a target for an assumed rate of return as step down that you would stop at some point at 5% or whatever it's going to be, or 6%. That's what I would prefer as a council member, much more surety. I understand that I can't get that, but there has been a very measured step down over time. And if POBs, if an infusion of POB money would change that, I need to know that. Because I am not at all convinced that an infusion of POB is the right thing to do. And I need as much information as possible to take a risk with taxpayer dollars in this way. And I know I'm not alone on the council on that, although I may not speak for all of my colleagues. On this too, Councilmember Davis, um, I certainly understand where you're coming from. And again, I just wanted to make sure that considerations were publicly understood. And I understand your question. And you know, we just will have to have further discussions uh, publicly in this issue. Yeah, and, and, and Councilmember Davis, it's obviously an extremely important variable on the city side and doing the analysis that we need to do for the council in helping them make the decision to move forward. And that's why we have to continue to assume that that rate of return will go down, but having some assurity about at what rate the rate of return will go down is important for my all my colleagues to know. Uh, th thank you. Uh liaison Davis. I see we have also a hand from Council Lederman. Would you like to go ahead? Barbie?
may, may, Harvey may be having some technical difficulties. Uh, let's go then to uh, CIO Polani. Thank you, you Mr. Floor? Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to remind everyone, and I think it's particularly important uh, in the question that Council Member Davis asked. The fact is that we've had a terrific year in the markets, uh, which means assumed rate of returns are going to be lower going forward. Um, that's the way markets work. And in fact, we have a discount rate of six and five eights right now. And I, I've, I just looked at capital market assumptions recently, and there are only four asset classes that exceed that, you know, in terms of projections going forward. Uh, private equity is one of them. Emerging market equity is another. Um, growth real estate is a third. And I think there's infrastructure in there somewhere. So we will have reduced return expectations going forward. And she's absolutely right that we need to be concerned about that. And we should be thinking about that. But I just wanted to throw in one more uh, variable into this picture, if I may. One is that, you know, there's we tinker with the with the discount rate, and that has a lot of impact on a variety of things, including contributions from the city and employees. You could do that without actually changing your risk profile. If anything, reduced capital market assumptions mean that we may have to get more aggressive going forward in order to be able to hit that six to seven percent target that we're looking for. So there's two different levers here, and I just wanted to make the point. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to uh, Council Lederman. You had your hand up before. We we couldn't hear what you had to say. Are you with us now? Council Lederman. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Ah, uh, wonderful. Thank you. Sorry for the uh, snafu. I wanted to ask um, the gentleman, I think it's uh, Mr. Morales, about one slide that he had in the presentation uh, for the board's education here. It was on slide 22, if you could go back to that. Yeah, thank you. Under the uh, green uh, right-hand column, the plan percentage return, could you explain what you mean by the second major bullet point, leverage investment position, 50% and the discussion under that. I didn't quite uh, gather what, what that was meant to convey. Certainly I can, Councilmember. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think I'll harken back to another point. The way a pension obligation bond for the city works is it refinances the payments that you have, those fixed dollar payments that you have back to the plan to pay off its unfunded liability. But then we mentioned that in order to really assess the impact, that the money is, uh, as opposed to a traditional mortgage finance, where you just lower payments, the monies then go to be deposited with, uh, with the plan. And hopefully your asset base, your, your actuarial market value increases. And there goes the, the leverage notion that, and it depends on the amount of the POB, increases your leverage. So if you, um, just a simple, simple illustration, if you have a $100 million balance and you add another $20 million, your leverage position has gone up $20 million. If you add $50 million, then 50% mil, uh, increase. And think of it another way is that if you have a 10% return with a $100 million balance, you'll get a $10, $10 million in investment return. A $150 million balance, you'll get a $15 million return. So that is really the essence of what a pension obligation bond does and why, why that's linked to how important the returns are in the initial year. You get that power of compounding is more significant in the initial years. When you really compare a pension obligation bond, you compare it to making the payments as usual. At the end, near 15, 20 years of a, of a borrowing, the impact of these small investments and the impact of additional investments near the end is nowhere near as significant as it is in the first year. And what the staff had asked me to really focus on was the risk during the initial year. So if you take the exact opposite, if you lost 10% under the $100 million scenario, 
you'd lose 10 million and you'd lose comparably 15 million under the 150 million dollar scenario. And of course, government is ultimately keenly um, aware of losses and and more more sensitive to the downward pressure, obviously, of a pension obligation bond than they are to the gain. So that was the idea of explaining what leverage is and why that, that's intimately tied to the investment returns in the initial years. Is that a clear in that explanation? Yes, thank you. I, I just want to make sure that I understood correctly that you were not suggesting that the proceeds, that the board would use the proceeds and leverage them uh, uh, over 100% of what those proceeds are to make more in returns. And I understand that is not what you were suggesting, so thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I, the next hand I have up is uh, Bill Hallmark from Chiron. You have the floor, sir? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify something going back to Council Member uh, Davis's comments. Uh, and Mr. Polanyi's build up of Mr. Polanyi's comments. The, the discount rate we use, we uh, are using as a budgeting device, really, in, in determining what we expect the fund to get in terms of investment returns versus what has to come in contributions. When you're looking at the effect of the POB, the most important thing is what the actual returns are over the period, and less so what we do with the discount rate. Now, the discount rate as that budgeting uh, device certainly has an impact on the city's contributions in the near term. Longer term, it's going to be much more impacted by what actual investment returns are. And then further, in the near term, the board also has control over the amortization policy. And so we've set up these amortizations, but we have the ability to tweak those amortizations and in combination with changes in the discount rate to control uh, the level of city contributions over different periods of time. So there's a, there's a lot of budgetary controls here. And so if the city's focusing on the effect of short-term contributions, that's one set of conversations with the board. Uh, but if they're analyzing the investment side, that's more a question of how the assets are invested and what is reasonable to expect from the markets uh, compared to the cost of borrowing. And to that point, we're interested in, in both things. And I just wanted to make it clear that the amount that we're paying in the short term and the discount rate being the, the largest indicator of how, how much we pay. Um, in my experience, the amortization schedule hasn't changed on a regular basis. It has maybe once or twice since I've been in office now almost five years that both of those things, not just how it's invested, but how much we're paying in the short term are important to the decision. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Hallmark. Uh, trustees, any further questions or comments? And trustee uh, Horowitz, uh, if I could, it's Trustee Chandra. Um, I don't have any questions, and I want to thank everyone who's presented or commented thus far. I think it's comprehensive, and uh, good chance I'm missing something, but I don't feel I am. I feel I've got a good perspective on what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, the comment uh, is where I remain stuck is in the catch-22 that someone alluded to earlier, and I feel that, personally speaking, this forum isn't the best place to, to shape some of the uh, the framework um, I know for myself uh, if it's a smaller amount uh, the the conversation's a bit more academic for me I think we can just roll um, the funds into what we're already doing if the amounts are high and, and I'm thinking in terms of now risk uh, I think we may have to uh, reconsider and, and rethink our strategic asset allocation a bit earlier than we normally do um, but I don't know how to have that conversation today, and I'm wondering if 
the right thing to do is to have the investment staff and the city staff uh, create a framework uh, with some inputs and, and then come back to us. Um, and if we need to drive to something a bit stronger, more tangible, I'm open to that as well. Uh, thank you, Trustee Chandra. I, I think uh, your comments echo very much my own thinking at the moment, which is that it's a bit murky how we move forward on this iterative uh, chicken and egg problem. Uh, I certainly understand city council's desire for a degree of assurity, um, for instance, on something like what our plans might be for a discount rate going forward, but we have no long range plan for that and we never do. We set that year by year as conditions change and uh, you know, we, we will never probably come to uh, to providing that level of assurance. Um, so I'm, I'm not really yeah. sure what the form and the format will be to iteratively look at the size of the bond versus how we may change allocations and risk profiles. Um, yeah, and, 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 I, and I guess it's up to, to ORS staff to maybe come forward with a, a plan or a program of how we do that. Yeah, I uh, just if, if it's helpful, uh, you know, the, the smaller the amount, the, the more for me, it's, uh, you know, proceed as normal. And, and as far as the discount rate goes, um, you know, whether we have 6 billion under management or 20 billion under management, um, the discount rate to me is a function not of the AUM, but it's a function of market conditions, the work that the great work that we get from Makita as well, in giving us inputs on what's realistic. Um, you know, if this was the 80s or 90s, we would just be in, in bonds, we'd be super safe and we'd be blowing away our discount rate. And unfortunately, there are too many factors. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, Chairman Horowitz, um, you know, we tend to do this on an annualized basis. We, we have a pattern of having been reducing the discount rate over time. I've never bothered to think about whether in, in, in hindsight, certainly it was never by design uh, looking forward, but maybe in the hindsight, there has been a pattern of a certain percentage uh, that seems to be within like a reasonable band that we, we do every year, every couple of years. Um, you know, but beyond that, I, I, I don't see the discount rate. I'm struggling to see how the discount rate is tied at all to uh, strategic asset allocation. Uh, sorry, the decisions we make on, on strategic asset allocation based on whether we have a seven billion dollar. Well, I'm mean, whenever I say seven, I'm throwing in police and fire. Uh, whatever our number is, double or triple it, it, it wouldn't affect the calculation for me or the analysis. I should say. Uh, understood. I, I think yeah. I don't think it has to do with the size of the assets under management. Uh, I think we we tend and and we should set the discount rate as conditions apply and conditions can be very different two or three years from now. And of course, the board can be completely different two or three years from now. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, and the only reason I said that is, is the, 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 the fact of the POB or the size of the POB. Uh, it, let's say that was the egg, so therefore it, it was, you know, it, it comes first. We knew that number. Um, I, I don't think I would at all have that in my mind as I thought about um, discount rate. Mm -hmm. Understood. Uh, uh, any further trustee comments or questions? Any public comment or questions? Well, I want to thank again city staff and all of the comments uh, from all parties. This is probably one of the more critical issues we have taken up as a board, and uh, it will be very important for both the pension plan and the city going forward. So it deserves a great deal of our time, thought, and analysis. So thank you to the presenters. M Mr. Chair? Yes. If I if I may, I just want to echo uh, those words. Obviously, uh, Prabhu and I have been in touch with the city staff. I want to thank uh, Julia and the rest of the staff, and the staff from the Human Features Inc. Uh, with the presentation and the information. Obviously, they will be coming back to make the same presentation uh, to the Police and Fire Board. Um, I think 
uh, per the request and, and uh, direction from the boards, we as in staff, Prabhu and I have um, stay in communication with the city and plan to continue working with them and as needed, uh, if uh, depending on how the agenda for the joint meeting is developed, uh, there may be some presentations by some consultants. So we will continue our work and communication with city staff on this issue to make sure, obviously, I think this is critical, the city council and both boards have the data and, and the information they need to make an informed decision. We still have two board meetings in September, and there is further uh, uh, discussions to be had on non-investment side of the equation, but we also plan to have uh, a legal presentation by your general counsel on, on what are, in general, the you, you most important uh, fiduciary responsibilities uh, in general, but also as it relates to the POB issue. So I just wanted to, to make that point. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Julia, thank you again to you and the staff. Much appreciated. Yeah, we look forward to working with your team, Roberto. Okay, thank you. Thank you, CEO uh, Pena. Uh, I believe we're ready to close out this agenda item. Yes. And uh, we will move now to item 4A, oral update from CEO Pena. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, it's been a long meeting, so I'll try to be quick. I, I want to actually announce that uh, we actually uh, uh, on board a brand new uh, retirement benefits manager. Uh, she came to us from the uh, uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, Sandra Castigiano uh, has over 24 years uh, of experience with the city, uh, studied in HR, and again, Department of Transportation of the last uh, few years. She joined us last August 9th. Um, Sandra, welcome. Uh, uh, we look forward to working with you, hopefully for many years to come. We're very excited about uh, her approach, uh, how positive she is, her energy, and really, honestly, um, the, the kind of uh, knowledge she brings from the city, uh, city processes. So we're looking forward to work on, uh, work on, uh, working with her. Sandra, welcome to RS. We are also working on recruiting uh, a benefit analyst. Uh, most of the work has been completed. We're hoping to have someone on board uh, right after Labor Day weekend by September 5th. Um, I also wanted to keep you posted. Uh, and I don't know if Julia is still at the meeting or maybe Ms. Davis. Um, you know, as a board, that we uh, are going to continue having uh, your board meetings uh, virtual through September 30th. I also know that's the last day that the, um, the extension or the flexibility of the law uh, passed by the governor that allows for virtual meetings. But I also know that, that the city council, Ms. Davis, has started meetings in person, although it's somewhat hybrid, you also can attend uh, uh, virtually. But your meetings now, are, I think most of you are actually a city hall. So I was wondering, the September 30th meeting, do we know if it's going to be a virtual meeting, a hybrid? Uh, is it going to be, do we prefer that everyone is, is present per, uh, physically? I haven't asked specifically about that meeting. I know that, uh, so we have not been having committee meetings in person mm -hmm. because of the, um, the concern about distancing. We've only been having open session city council meetings in person. I would guess since it is such a large group with three, the two boards plus the council meeting at the same time that we will need to do that uh, virtually. Yes, thank you, Ms. Davis. I, I feel the same way. And so I just want, I will keep the board apprised, but I, I feel just like you that it's such a large, I mean, we're 16, 13 members right now in different seats plus the city council is about 24 members. So yes, on this two. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I wanted to bring uh, update the board is that the city actually has started um, a soft uh, stage process of returning uh, to work on site. Um, and so as uh, Council Member Davis indicated, at least the city council open meetings are, are physical at the city chambers. Uh, I know that they're allowing um, um, people to actually through appointments uh, actually go by city hall uh, and we and the city also started uh, welcoming back some of the employees. Now, of course, with the latest increase in the Delta variant, 
I think that that stage has been pushed forward. There was a two-stage process, August and September. <clears throat> I think the second stage has been pushed forward to possibly the end of September or very early October, I think third or fourth, which is a Monday. And I just wanted to share with the board that we our office are, are, are sort of following the similar plan. Um, we held a meeting with our staff uh, last month, uh, went over some a survey of questions about um, their views on returning back to, to work at the office. When we are ready to kick back, uh, welcoming back employees, we will ease it to a hybrid approach. Uh, we do have a somewhat hybrid right now. We still have some staff that comes in for a specific essential duties such as check printing, scanning, and mail processing. So it's a very, very uh, low number of staff that come by the office today. But suffice to say that we will continue working with the city and, and watching how this Delta variant develops and we'll keep the board apprised on our plans to, to start working back staff to the office on a hybrid approach. In the meantime, the city has requested that all employees provide a vaccine certification or verification um, or also meet to weekly COVID testing by this Monday, August 23rd. Uh, our office is in the process of conducting that vaccine uh, verification with our staff so that we can provide that information to the, to the uh, city uh, I think our goal is tomorrow afternoon, Friday, if not by sometime uh, Monday. Um, and that, in a nutshell, completes uh, our update. One last comment for you, board is, as you know, your board is down to five members. There are two seats that are open right now. One employee applicant. Uh, um, actually filed the application uh, and seen the process to be reviewed by the city clerk. And the same for the retiree seat. Uh, city Clare has received one application. Uh, we have been uh, working with the city clerk and coordination to find out uh, when those two processes uh, deadlines are. Uh, as far as I understand, they're still both open. And uh, as far as I understand, they are setting applications. Uh, but we'll keep you uh, updated on the process. Um, it, it is my estimate that, that given the current process, we probably won't have a full board of both seats until either December or possibly January. But the hopes are that the sooner the better, as soon as the process are completed and the appointment goes to the process of the city council, uh, we will keep you posted on that. And Mr. Chair, that uh, concludes my, uh, my comments. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Are there any questions from the trustees? or from the public. Okay, seeing no raised hands, we'll move to item 4B, uh, oral update from city council liaison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have a, a long update, just wanted to let everybody know, as, as Roberto stated, we have been in person now for um, a couple of weeks since the beginning of August when we returned. We're doing closed session and all committee meetings still on Zoom. Um, completely virtual. And then uh, council meetings are in person. All the council members um, have been present for, for all, the, uh, all the meetings except one, one time uh, was virtual, but it, it is still allowed to be a hybrid meeting. Um, so the public is generally has been attending uh, virtually and calling either calling in or, or Zooming in to speak. So we don't have a lot of guests, although we do have the ability to entertain guests in city hall chambers. And, and that's pretty much it for, we're just starting to get back into the swing of things after the July recess. So okay. not, not anything major going on yet. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Any questions from trustees or the public? Seeing no hands raised, uh, we'll move forward to item 4F, which is an update on the communication plan. Mr. Chair, I think it's 4E first. The, the, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that uh, observation. Uh, 4E, discussion and staff recommendation, uh, approval of the CEO to negotiate, negotiate an agreement with Work Health Solutions to provide our disability medical examination services. Uh, 
CEO Pena would like to present that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will uh, kick it off and I'll turn it over to Barbara Heyman, uh, our Deputy Director, who actually led the, uh, the team that uh, was involved uh, in the review of this RFP for Medical Board Advisor. Uh, you may recall that your prior Board Medical Advisor contract expired mid-June and that this request for proposal uh, I was, uh, have been in place for a while and the uh, staff was reviewing the applications. Uh, so I completed their work uh, through the summer and uh, we made the same presentation to the police and fire other meeting two weeks ago and here with you this morning uh, to provide you with the summary of, of our recommendation. Uh, Barbara Heyman, hopefully you had a chance to go over the memo that was provided by staff. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Barbara. Uh, welcome, Barbara, thank you. Thank you, uh, good afternoon. Yes, Barbara Heyman, Deputy Director for um, ORS. Uh, so yes, this memo is requesting approval for the CEO to negotiate and execute an agreement uh, with Work Health Solutions to provide disability medical evaluation services for an amount not to exceed 100,000 for fiscal year 2021-22. For two one year extension options to extend beyond June 30, 2022. So, as Roberto mentioned uh, earlier this year, the board medical advisor, Dr. Susan Tierman, who provided disability medical evaluation services, um, announced that she was retiring. And so, staff issued a request for proposal seeking a new board medical board advisor to provide uh, disability medical evaluation services. Um, following that, uh, three vendors did respond to the RFP. Uh, they were Managed Medical Review Organization, Work Care, and Work Health Solutions. Um, so the services requested including, uh, included assessing the medical um, information regarding uh, each applicant's claims for disability, uh, identifying the medical specialty needed for the medical examination. Um, now, the doctor that will actually conduct the, the applicant medical examinations will be a physician from the board's um, independent medical evaluator vendors, and, and those are exam works or MedLink. Uh, so, um, services requested also included um, reviewing the IME report and writing an independent report for the board as well as attending all meetings and providing supplemental medical reports and expert testimony as needed. Uh, the three committee members that included Dr. Tierman assessed the three proposals and conducted interviews for each of the vendors. Um, MMRO, uh, they didn't fully understand the role of the disability medical evaluator. Most of their written proposal was focused on the work of an IME and administrative work. They did not name an occupational medical physician who would review the work of the IME and present uh, uh, their findings at meetings. Uh, work care, uh, they did offer a physician, Dr. Irene Grace, uh, who specialised in occupational medicine, but she didn't anticipate having to come to meetings in person as she, as she lives actually out of state. Um, work health solutions offered Dr. Rajiv Doss. Uh, he served actually in the capacity of the board's medical advisor for 12 years. He had, uh, he had the most direct experience of all of the proposers. Um, and as outlined in the memo, costs of each of the vendors were also compared. Overall, though, the panel agreed that, um, to uh, recommend work health solutions. Dr. Doss has more direct experience in the position and they have a strong administrative team which could help expedite uh, the processing of disability cases. Um, so staff are requesting board approval for the CEO to negotiate and execute an agreement with Worth Health Solutions. And that concludes my summary. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions by uh, trustees? Uh, Barbara, this is Trustee Jennings. So that means we're going to, uh, if we go with this, we'll get Dr. Doss back? We will be using Dr. Doss as the board medical advisor, yes. 
Oh, that's great news. That's kind of win, huh? I remember yeah. him. Yeah, yes, this yes. good. Yep. He, he's yeah. A so uh, for those other trustees, um, yeah, Dr. Doss used to be our guy that uh, we used um, probably when I first started, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's been 19 years in October, but I know he was around. So, um, yeah, I think that's outstanding. So I support it. A any other comments or questions? Do I hear a motion uh, to approve the uh, request for the CEO to negotiate and execute this agreement? I'll motion to uh, accept. That's yeah. a motion by Trustee Jennings. Is there a second? Yeah, Trustee Chandra, I'll second. Okay, that's a second by Trustee Chandra. Uh, any further discussion by trustees? Any public comments? We'll move to a roll call vote. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Orr? Trustee Orr. She may have stepped away. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Jennings? Aye. Uh, once again, Trustee Orr? Uh, Mr. Chair, oh, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. Okay. Trustee Orr left the meeting after closed session. So he's mm -hmm. been the four of you since then, just so you know. Okay. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Thank uh, you. So then I also vote aye. So the motion carries unanimously. Uh, so we move on to item 4F, the ORS communication plan. And I believe that's also Barbara Heyman presenting. Yes, thank uh, you. Uh, Roberto, did you want to say anything? Um, no, go ahead, Barbara, uh, take it from okay. there. Thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, no, so this, this memo is giving you an update on the communication activities that were part of the board's strategic communication plan. The timeline for the activities was presented to the board in August 2020. The timeline shows activities through June 30th, 2022. And we're can, I, can I interrupt just for a moment? Can we uh, click on the attachment so we can all see the, the communication plan on the, uh, on the screen? Thank you. Sure, I'll bring it Sorry, up. Go ahead. Um, okay. We are planning on providing an update roughly every you know, six months. Uh, and the last update provided was earlier this year in February. Um, the activities planned up to June 2021 included the website redesign, uh, developing a contract for videography, um, planning to produce four con vid videos, um, con style videos and additional webinars, uh, launch our Facebook and Twitter accounts and post the state of the retirement system address video. Mm -hmm. Um, so the website redesign, uh, as Roberta mentioned earlier, the newly redesigned Office of Retirement Services website was launched in, on June 17th. Um, earlier this year, staff made a presentation of the new site for the board prior to the launch, you may remember. Um, updates mm -hmm. to the website are continuing and ORS staff are reviewing the, week, the website on a weekly basis uh, to ensure the necessary, um, we have the necessary content as well as reviewing and updating existing uh, content and planning for new content. Um, now, for the development of the videography, a contract hasn't been developed. However, we have researched and identified possible vendors um, producing the, the webinars and videos is proving um, very time consuming uh, for in-house. Um, for the plan to produce uh, con, additional con style videos, ORS is currently working on reviewing and approving scripts for videos, including the retirement application process. Uh, if possible, we would produce them in-house. However, as I mentioned, uh, the use of an outside contractor is also being considered. Um, for the additional webinars, uh, ORS has held a series of webinars including uh, the retirement group counseling in addition to uh, retirement planning workshops and ORS plans to develop a recorded version of these sessions to be available on the website. 
The webinars currently available on the website cover insurance topics such as open enrollment, vision insurance, Delta, dental insurance. Um, ORS has identified several other topics for webinars and videos, including um, transitioning to Medicare, uh, thinking of retirement, change of address, reporting of death, divorce, and, uh, and reciprocity, among others. Um, the webinars haven't been created yet, but we will um, make them available on our website as they are completed, and they'll be included in future updates. Uh, ORS did launch the Facebook and Twitter accounts. Uh, they were launched back in May. Um, multiple posts are scheduled for every week for each of the sites. Um, and the, the state of the retirement system address, ORS hasn't completed that yet. Uh, we plan to create a state of um, the retirement system early in 2022 at this point. Um, and as Roberta mentioned earlier, ORS has continued to publish and distribute distribute the Retirement Connection newsletter. Uh, the next newsletter will be published in October 2021. And um, yes, that I think concludes the update for the communication plan. Great, thank you. Any questions from trustees? Or the public? Okay, seeing no hands raised. Thank you so much for the for the update. We appreciate the information. I think we're we are all in, enjoying all the new communication channels we have. Um, we're going to move forward then to item four G. Discussion and action on election of board vice chair. And uh, I'll ask CEO Pena to uh, briefly describe our current governance uh, situation. And, yeah. and what we have to do next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So before you are uh, three documents, uh, which is the fit board chair charter, the vice chair charter, and then the election board's officers. Uh, so quickly, and in a nutshell, how this is supposed to work is um, you have a chair and a vice chair, which used to be trustee Cassie Jan or Horowitz, if you read the charter of the vice chair, when the board chair resigned prior to the end of his or her uh, time frame, the vice chair will becomes your new chair. Uh, so therefore, uh, your former vice chair, Trustee Horowitz, uh, became the new Fed chair. Uh, with that, I also went ahead a big pay increase uh, to uh, Trustee Horowitz. He's probably going to get two launches in the future when we start getting back to have this meeting in person. So uh, the bottom line is now that you have a, a chair, um, the request is before you this, this afternoon is for you to elect a vice chair. Uh, to support not only Trustee Horowitz in the process, but also um, the vice chair, it is important that you elect a vice chair in the event that Trustee Horowitz is not available for a particular meeting or a particular event, the vice chair will step, step in in his place. So that's, that's basically how it works. And so that's what before you. Um, I recognize we are in a bit of a challenge here, number one, because you are down two seats out of the seven. Mm -hmm. And number two, with trustee or not being available um, and with trustee Horowitz being the chair, <laughs> he only leaves three, three possible selections for you vice chair. Uh, so I'd like to throw something out here. I um, would be willing to step into that. I think I've been here over a year now, so I could, uh, but that's only if no one else wants it. Yeah, unfortunately. Else wants it, I think that's fine. Um, I would not be able to take on that responsibility at the present time, and I would enthusiastically endorse Trustee Jennings as um, vice chair. Well, as a former vice chair, I, I certainly understand uh, everyone's reluctance, as I was equally reluctant last December, and I did also want to chair. observe that. <laughs> The, my, my term as chair uh, is, is through the remainder of the year and we will have new elections in, in December. 
Th that is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for providing that, uh, that important note. Although usually, I just want to let you know, your board has a huge history of once uh, a trustee becomes a chair, they support the chairmanship for years. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's uh, the meeting is supposed to start at 12 30. Uh, I'm sorry, someone interjected. No, that, that was a, that was a, I think, a, a comment by staff. We we have an audit committee that was supposed to yeah. start at 12 30. We already advised the audit committee members of police and fire that it will probably be more closer to one o'clock, so we can continue the meeting. Great, uh, uh, Council Lederman, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a point of order. I, I believe under the policy that you have attached that today is a nominating uh, <clears throat> meeting and uh, the vote for the new vice chair would come at the next meeting. Right. Thank you. Okay. So the, now, the, now, the vice chair then wouldn't begin service until after the election at the next meeting. Right. Now, under the circumstances, you could, because of uh, the size of the group at this point, it, uh, you could um, amend that policy and, and go forward today. It would take the vote of four board members to do that. Thank you, uh, Council. I, I would okay. recommend that approach if your board is so inclined to do so. Thank you, Council. Okay. So uh, I guess then I'll I'll ask if there is a a nomination to be made on the floor and a second. Sure, I'll nominate uh, Trustee Jennings to be elected vice chair and to hold a vote today. So motioned by Trustee Kelleher. Okay, and do we have a second? I, I will second that motion, Trustee Chandra. Okay, and uh, the the full motion that. Uh, for Jennings to serve as yeah. vice chair and for the uh, determining vote to be taken now. Yeah, but, but exactly, both parts. If, okay. if I may, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, let's, why don't we unpack that because nominations don't require a motion. Um, oh. So if uh, what it would be, it would be a motion to amend the board policy uh, to allow the nominations and the election to occur at the same meeting. I see. Shall we take that one first then? Sure. This is Trustee Kelleher. I'd like to motion that we amend the board's policy to allow for nominations for the uh, executive vice chairman uh, to be taken and voted on on the same day. Okay. So, uh, that's, uh, and do we have a second to that motion? Trustee Chandra, I will second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion by trustees? Any discussion by the public? We will take a vote. Uh, Trustee Chandra. I vote aye. Trustee Keller. Aye. Trustee Jennings. Aye. And I vote aye, so that carries unanimously. Okay, and now we have a vote a straight vote for the position of vice chair. So I assume then we just go down a roll call vote since there's no nominating process. So I'll go through the same roster. Uh, Trustee Chandra, how say you to having Trustee Jennings as vice chair? Aye. And Trustee Kelleher? Aye. And Trustee Jennings? Aye. And I vote aye as well, so that carries unanimously. Congratulations, Trustee uh, Jennings. You are now vice chair. I, I would love to tell you that it will take very little time and uh, we uh, have no consequence, but I'm clearly not in the position to say that <laughs> in the current circumstance. All right, item 4H, discussion and action on the board committee assignments. Mm. Uh, and if we could call up the attachment on the current assignments and I'm, uh, Council uh, Lederman, uh, would you like to advise uh, how the board assignments and the Brown Act interact given our current status of only five trustees? Hmm. Yes, th thank you. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, committees um, uh, can only be made up of less than a majority 
of the board and and in calculating a majority um, you have to go by the actual number of board members not the number of board seats so in this case right now uh, committees can have must have less than a majority of five which would be three so the committees when the committees meet so that they do not become full board meetings of a majority of the board they must be they must only have two members who meet now it's possible to assign more than two to a committee but when the meetings take place it's going to have to be a meeting of only two people it's, it's unfortunate, but we start with a small board of seven in the first place, and then we're down by two. It makes it even more difficult. So for the next couple of months, um, there's going to be a, a lot of shouldering responsibilities that would otherwise be spread more evenly. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may add to those comments by council, um, I completely, obviously, from a legal standpoint, he's the attorney, he knows what he's talking about. I would just suggest to, for example, for the investment and the audit committee, you can still leave the three members. You just have to make sure that when we schedule the meeting, only two of them will be attending, not three. Um, so to that extent, I would recommend, um, I don't recall if you wanted to step of the audit committee, Trustee Horowitz. Uh, I don't recall if that's the case or not, but uh, for the investment committee, you can leave those three uh, so that when we get back to seven, we can have the three members attending. Until that point, we should only have two members attending the meetings. I am aware that uh, since you're the chair now, you are looking to have someone become the chair for the governance committee. Uh, and then with Julie, Jenny now, that will be two members. And then the joint personnel committee, which is a very important one, um, we can only have two of you attend the meeting. You, as a chair, will become uh, a member of that committee now. And with Trustee Chandra being the chair of the investment committee, he's also a member of that committee. Uh, and then Elaine or Trustee Orr was uh, the last trustee selected, who happens to be the vice chair of the joint committee. Um, she, the three of you cannot attend the meeting at the same time when we meet next time. So you can still, uh, we can still have you added to that committee. It's just again making sure that only two of you at a time attend the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Harvey, do you still have your hand raised? Is some clarification you'd like to provide? No, I'm sorry. I'll take my hand down. Forgive okay. me. Can, so can I ask one question? Um, I'm sorry. Sure. The um, so we do have what five people, right? Mm -hmm. Do we? Yeah. Yes. So it. So how come we only have two people on a committee and not three? I mean, three's less than three five. Be three becomes a uh, a majority of the board by round. Oh, it becomes a majority. I got you. Yeah. So we it's can't a, have a it's majority. A brown act, brown oh, act right. violation. All right. Or potentially so. So we can only have two. So in terms of, it seems uh, CEO Pena, you're suggesting that we leave three names on various committees, but somehow one um, member will agree not to attend. Is that more clarifying than simply removing a name from the committee so we know exactly who should attend and not attend going forward? I would remove one. <laughs> Confusing uh, other one. Uh, trustees, I, I, do, do we have any opinion on that? I think we should, I mean, my only reaction to that is then when we're more fully staffed, we're, we're uh, reassigning not only the, we're not only assigning new people, reassigning existing people. I, I think, uh, I would keep it as is. I don't think it's hard to do the round robin on who sits out a meeting until we fill the board. That That's my personal opinion. Okay. I, I see uh, both Council Lederman and CIO Polani have their hands raised. <laughs> Again, going first to uh, Council Lederman. All right. I didn't mean to have the hand up again. Okay. I'm digitally challenged. I, I understand. Um, uh, CIO Polani, then. 
Yeah, just wanted to let the board know that uh, we have an investment committee meeting next week and trustee Orr has already indicated to us that she's not able, able to attend. So we will have only two IC members at that meeting. And the meeting after that will be at the end of October. Okay, although we, we still may not be up to full complement of trustees at that time. Very plausible. Yeah. It sounds like the sentiment then is to, to leave assignments uh, where they are and, and, and adjust ad hoc who actually attends each committee. And I guess the chairs of each committee uh, will take the lead in that. Uh, as for myself, uh, the chair is obligated to sit on the joint personnel committee. So that vacancy that currently exists will be filled by myself. Mm -hmm. And that would mean I would have three committee assignments, uh, which I think is a, a bit uh, unusual. So I would request that that assignment is made and that I am removed from the audit committee. And uh, do we need a, a vote then of the board to, uh, to acknowledge and confirm that move? You, okay, you so let me understand it. You're going to be chair of the joint personnel committee. Chair. No, not, not chair, but I will be a member. A member. Okay. Uh, Why is it or a vice chair and not a chair? I, I don't get it. But, let me tell you that, Professor The joint personnel committee is the only committee that is really, you see the word join ahead of it, is the only committee oh. that's actually joined between the police and fire and federated. I see. So okay. there is a chair who actually sits on the police and fire and the vice mm -hmm. chair sits at the federated board. Okay. But, but it's a, uh, an ex officio position. That's an assignment that a, the chair of our board must be on the joint personnel committee. Okay, so you're gonna come off the audit committee. We're just gonna keep two people and have a vacancy or we're gonna put someone on? I think for now that's something we can deal with since uh, okay. we cannot have three attending in any case. Okay. I would continue to chair the governance committee. And of course, at the top where it says uh, vice chair vacant, we will have uh, uh, trustee Jennings name filled in there. Okay. So uh, procedurally, is this something that I can make an assignment as chair or do we need a vote of the board to confirm this? Uh, see your opinion. I, I, defer, I defer to council, but I always like the motions so that we can be reflected uh, as such at the, at the board meetings. Okay. Uh, 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 Council Lederman, did you have something to add that, to that? No, why don't you go ahead and have a motion made to approve it. Okay. Uh, so can I hear a motion to remove me from the audit committee, add me to the joint personal committee, and to acknowledge that uh, Trustee Jennings is now the vice chair of the entire board. Do I hear such a motion? Almost. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I will make such a motion if, if we can do it omnibus like that. Sure. I, I make that motion. I can't repeat it, but I make it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked if I heard it. Yeah. So, I, uh, I will uh, second the motion. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion by trustees? Any discussion by public? So we'll have a roll call vote. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Keller? Aye, I'd like to thank you for your work on the audit committee. <laughs> thank you. I uh, appreciate your sense of humor. And <laughs> Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. And I also vote aye. So that are, those are the new committee assignments. Okay, moving to the next agenda item. And they are committee reports. Hmm. So item 5-1 is the investment committee. Hmm. Uh, CEO Chandra is here. Do we, it looks like the oh, previous um, meeting was some time ago. Yeah. Pardon me, I think we skipped I, over um, item for I. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep missing these ones. The very thin, thin, small text. I'm sorry. Uh, item for I. Um, who is going to present on that? So, 
Uh, Trustee um, Chair Horowitz, I think we left this item there in the event that you wanted to discuss it. If the meeting was running kind of short, it's up <laughs> to you if you want to discuss it. Now, we do have to break at one o'clock. Um, I did raise the issue in my order report with uh, Councilmember Davis about the virtual meetings, and it appears that we are going to be having virtual meetings to September 30th. The question is, after that, we may have no choice but to start having them in person, or there might be some sort of a hybrid. So, uh, bottom line here is, would you like to have that discussion now, or would you like to have it in September? This is about uh, virtual meetings, or what? No, this is about what are we going to do after September 30th? Are, are we going to ask to continue having meetings virtually, but there are some requirements that have to be met uh, from Brown Act in the event that the current law that allows for flexibility for the for the virtual meetings is not extended past September 30th, there are some specific requirements in terms of, um, you know, what trustees have to do about where they have, they have to be located so that there is a quote right, right. and about providing uh, enough uh, information to the public as to where they're located for the meeting. Uh, I so like that. the idea of going for virtual meetings as long as we can. I mean, I think um, as a city, we're being a little short-sighted about what this Delta variant is and how it's not going away. And um, I believe if you look at the science, this is not going to go away until 2022. And we're getting into the winter time. So I think it's more optimistic than realistic. So I would like, and, and given that some of our trustees are people that are either taking care of elderly, are elderly, et cetera, et cetera, I would like the virtual to go as long as possible. I uh, would concur with that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of information that we don't know yet. And, um, you know, certainly um, the Delta variant is uh, quite contagious. And mm -hmm. uh, as a, I'm not sure if uh, you were referring to me when you said that some of the trustees are elderly. Uh, <laughs> no, I was referring to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was feeling a little offended myself. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was talking about myself. Yeah, but- She was know, talking about the police and fire board. Yeah, we are, <laughs> exactly. We are, uh, we're, we're certainly caring for, uh, 90 year old uh, parents. So uh, right. we're very sensitive to uh, mm -hmm. our exposure. So if I could provide a little bit of background on this. So during the COVID-19 um, onset in March of 2020, the governor issued an executive order that suspended some of the Brown Act requirements for open meeting laws, requiring the boards to be physically present at the same location at the same time. The governor in June of this year, issued another executive order that um, imposed a time limitation to um, take away his exemptions or suspension of those Brown Act requirements. And those the suspension of the Brown Act requirements by executive order um, is set currently to expire on um, September 30th. But as you say, Delta variant issues are being closely monitored. We do not know one way or the other whether or not they the governor will issue another executive order to reinstate those suspension of the Brown Act requirements. But until then, um, we'll be monitoring the situation, knowing that you may be required to attend in person starting in October, subject to the, the former Brown Act um, requirements. And even if that happens, where we come back, if we post outside our door, for the week or whatever, then we can continue to do virtually. So I want us as a board to continue to make the technology available for those who are willing to go through that um, when it becomes necessary. Right, um, so the teleconference rules from the um, under the, the original Brown Act would apply. Um, we, can, we can discuss that as a future meeting. I know we are short on time. Right. Yeah. I would just point out that from what I understand, Council Chin, um, the Brown Act requirements are that we can uh, dial in from a remote location, but those locations must be published on the public agenda. That's so that correct. That would be potentially our private home addresses. 
That's so there's something to consider. No, no action is required now. Let's hope the governor extends the, the current exemptions and, uh, and we'll have to make plans as, as we get closer to the date and find out if the governor is going to act or not. So I get, if there's no further comment, let's move to uh, agenda item under five, 5.1 investment committee. It looks like the last meeting was way back in April. Uh, uh, Chair Chandra, do we have anything new to report? And as we see, the next meeting will be in a few days in August 24th. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute while I was answering your question. Yeah, there is nope. nothing from prior one because we've covered it in, in subsequent meetings. And like you mentioned, we will be meeting next week uh, and we should have something to share in September. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, the Governance Committee met on June 17th and the main order of business at that time was to, um, uh, let's see, do we need to approve the minutes or we just simply receive them? Receive them file is fine, Mr. Chair. Okay, so we have a discussion and action uh, on the succession plan. Prior to now, we have not had a formal succession plan. And if we can click on that memo and bring that up on the screen, the governance committee, after considerable discussion and after reviewing succession plans at uh, formal succession plans at several other retirement systems uh, came up with our succession plan that we would hope the board will approve. It is fairly uh, minimal. There's not a lot of detail, but uh, sufficient detail. So if we can go down to the, I believe it's Appendix A, This is information about the other plans and how they handle things. But here is our proposed succession plan. And so in the event that the CEO is unable to carry out his or her duties by whatever reason, then the deputy director shall assume the position of interim CEO and all the duties of the CEO, either until the CEO returns or the boards jointly determine otherwise. In the case of the CIO is unable to carry out his or her duties, uh, the investment committee chairs shall jointly appoint an interim CEO um, who shall carry out the duties until the CIO returns or the boards jointly determine otherwise. And we note that the, the interim CEO position uh, in no way implies uh, a stepping stone to the position of CEO or CIO. It is truly an interim placeholder uh, position. And, um, uh, and that we still have the capability of, of uh, doing a search and recruitment of a new CEO or CIO, even as the interims serve. Uh, we further direct that the CEO take appropriate steps to ensure the deputy director receives all sufficient training and preparation so that that position can step into the position of interim CEO should it be necessary. And the CIO similarly takes steps to ensure that the senior investment officers are prepared for the possibility of assuming the position of interim CIO. And if we can scroll down, there's a few, just two more items, I believe. Mr. Chair, it's one o'clock. I don't know if you, we need to have a stop or oh. I'll come back at one five or, uh, or finish uh, the next couple of minutes. I'm not sure what you would like to do. Um, I think if you ask Lynn, that she would request that we stop and come back here, come back in five minutes. Okay, let's stop and come back at 105. And uh, I know the suspense is out there for what the other points are, but we'll get to them. <laughs> Thank you. So do we need to log back in or, or how do we play this? Linda, we just stay here, right? You stay here. Okay, okay. thank you. We'll come back in five minutes. For the audit committee, right? No, audit committee no, no, is a different no, number. No, this is the board. This is the board. This is the board. Oh, we're still we haven't finished. finished. Oh, okay, uh, gotcha. I'm right, sorry, I'm Vice Chair Jennings. We're not, we're not done yet. We're not ready yet. Okay. <laughs>
So the, just a few more points to, to the succession plan. In the event of a vacancy of either CEO or CIO, um, the JPC, just recently mentioned, as soon as practicable, will determine if an employment search should be conducted and what the details of such process would be. And they will make recommendations to the board. If the board's approved the need for a search, the JCP, JPC will coordinate and provide as provided for in the JPC charter. Board members may not be employed as CEO or CIO unless they have been off the boards for at least one year. And finally, any board member who may be interested in applying for the position of CEO or CIO is strongly advised to seek legal counsel and to refrain from discussion, discussions on anything to do with CEO or CIO succession or other matters as described here in the succession plan. So with that, I'll open to any questions from the trustees on the proposed succession plan. And uh, seeing none and none, no hand raised, any, any public comments? So I will entertain a motion to accept the succession plan and make it part of the, uh, the board's official uh, program. Uh, does, do I hear such a motion? I motion to accept. And, and do we have a part. second? I'll second the motion. All right, so that was uh, Trustee Jennings uh, with the motion, Trustee Kelleher with the second. And any discussion of the motion? Any public comment? We'll have a roll call vote. Trustee Chandra. I vote aye. Trustee Keller. Aye. Vice Chair Jennings. <laughs> aye. And I vote aye. So it passes unanimously. We have a new succession plan. Uh, audit committee last met in May 20th. Uh, Chair Kelleher, do we have anything to report out of that meeting? So Grant new. Yeah, Grant Thornton is continuing on, um, getting ready to uh, take the next step of the audit. But other than that, there's nothing new. <laughs> Very good. And uh, the Joint Personnel Committee, Trustee Orr is not with us at the moment. Last met April 30th, Trustee Chandra. Uh, is there anything to your knowledge that needs to be reported? Not to my knowledge. No, Mr. Chair, but we are going to try to schedule a meeting in September uh, because uh, the Joint Personnel Committee is going to engage in a mock evaluation process uh, for the CEO and CAO performance review. Um, they're going to just, again, a mock evaluation process because they're going to try to, to work through the process that was instituted and approved by the Joint Personnel Committee as if this past year results and metrics are used so that presumably what you will do is see what the results will be and if you need to tweak and make any changes you can still do that in anticipation of uh, next year when oh the fiscal year that is ending in 2022 will be the first year that that process will be implemented right and just to be clear the the evaluations that we discussed in closed session they will be completed and formalized I believe in time for the police and fire board meeting uh, in early September. That's correct. September 9th is our meeting. That, that is correct, okay. Mr. Chair. So it is incumbent on uh, uh, the the chair, vice chair, and of of both boards as well as the IC committees chairs and vice chairs to uh, to complete that those analysis and that performance evaluation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Uh, we're up to item number six, education and training. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there anything uh, that you would like to share with us, uh, CEO Pena, on these items? No, Mr. Chair, other than, you know, again, those are calipers, uh, um, one-day meetings, and as a director of calipers, I mean, full support of trustees attending them, especially now that they're virtual, so it's a lot easier. You don't have to travel. And so to the extent that you can either attend these uh, seminars or the two or three days uh, meetings, uh, I would strongly uh, recommend it. Very good, thank you. 
Uh, any future agenda items that we need to identify? Uh, I do have one question. Um, so normally on the discount rate, we have that conversation. Isn't that like later, like in the spring or something? When we do it? No, that discussion usually takes place, uh, Trustee Jennings, in the October to November timeframe in anticipation uh -huh. of, of Kyron, uh, finalizing the evaluation, uh, uh, the okay. actual evaluation. Okay, so we have time to address that before anything goes forward on any pension obligation bond or any of that kind. Do we? Or I don't do we know need to it, bring that up closer? And that's my I, little question. We the, 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 the city has a timing. I don't suggest that we are, you, you know, that discussion has to take place based on the information that we're going to get from Chiron, plus mm -hmm. some investment um, uh, consultant information. Now, the, mm -hmm. the capital market expectations, uh, Prabhu can speak to it, but they usually are available at the beginning of the, of the, of the calendar year, uh, January or February. So that is actually late for the discussion of the, of the actuarial process. But uh, until Chiron has a chance to provide you with a draft, I don't see mm -hmm. how, and the implications, I don't see how this board can have that discussion. You can have a discussion, but to, to have the data that you will probably want to have in order to make an informed decision, right? So I would say most likely will be in November. I don't know how that timing uh, falls within the city POB timing issue. I don't, I suspect it's still, it's still timely, timely enough, but I, I, I don't want to speak for them because I don't really know what the process will look like. Okay, because, you know, I mean, um, council member, uh, you know, Davis had very strong opinions. We got a presentation regarding that. And so, I mean, it seems like it's a timing thing. And that's why I'd asked those leading questions earlier on because it seems like whatever decision we make should be made beforehand, regardless if we get this obligation bond or not, you know, right? Uh, um, I would just okay. caution, yeah. you know, we just caution the board to continue the usual process and to make decisions mm -hmm. regardless of what's happening on the other side of the equation. Yeah, and I would Maybe like to reiterate that. Yeah. I'm sorry, Roberta, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was kind of I'm piggybacking on Roberta's comments. Um, I do want to again remind the board that our fiduciary duties and our interest in the administration of the plan is first and foremost for the members in the in the plan itself. What the city is deciding to do, whether or not they issue it or not, um, mm -hmm. is, is separate from our consideration. Of once once it's issued, then it becomes an issue for us to consider how to apply it and, and meet our fiduciary duties that way. So the one thing I'm confused on, and I understand that, and I agree. Um, so if they go forward with this on the assumption that it's at one P, one rate, right? Um, 6.67, is that what it is? Julie, I'm sorry to stop you. We yeah. are going to be going to an audit committee very soon. Is it possible to have that discussion offline? Because um, I, okay. I think you asked That'd the question fun. during the meeting. I think it's yeah. a fair question. I mean, I don't want to, I apologize, uh, Chair Horowitz, if you want to have the discussion now, I'm not even no, sure that, that we could, if, I know council has been very flexible about it, but I just, just whatever your preference is, I just assume we can have the discussion offline, but if the board wants to have it now, uh, I will not stand in the way. I, I, I would prefer to have it offline at this point. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, one quick suggestion, uh, CEO Pena, Perhaps we can just draw up a simple calendar uh, showing when during the year we make these various decisions. There's the discount rate, asset allocation, election of new officers, all those things that come up on an annual cycle. And I think that will be helpful also for the new trustees as mm. well as I don't think I've seen something like that myself. So um, yeah, just so we know, know the uh, typical timings for these. Okay, I agree. Y yes, okay. we can do that. And I just wanted to... Um, remind you, staff just reminded me that your meeting next month will not be on the usual thurs Thursday of the month. It will not be September 16th. It will be September 23rd, the fourth mm -hmm. Thursday of the month. Just a reminder. 
Okay. Yes, thank you. I do recall we changed that date. Uh, and I presume the agenda setting meeting will also push back a week. Yes. Very good. All right, so that is future agenda items. Are there any further public or retiree comments? Hearing none, uh, do we have a vote for adjournment or do I simply declare that we are adjourned? I, I suspect you can adjourn the meeting, Mr. Chair. Long meeting for right. the first meeting. Congratulations. All right, hearing no objection, this meeting stands adjourned. All right. Thank you, uh, Trustee Horowitz, um, Chairman Horowitz. Linda, we just go to us. We just have to hang up and go to a different meeting, right? For the audit committee. Yes, correct. Okay, very well. Thank you. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank everyone. you all.